you know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's single, my hate and nothing better. Put on the road, I just win. I know we got a million dollars, the devil that's it, and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the second part of, What if Naruto Enters Berserk? Special note, this fanfic is written and a masterpiece of Mojo the Space Monkey on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Gut stared into the water of the castle's moat, barely able to comprehend what he had heard from Griffith earlier. Naruto had been staring off into space for a few minutes after catching the behelot from Guts, barely breathing. Guts was considering pouring a bucket of water on the blonde's head when he jerked forward with a gasp, before he cast a quick look of fear at the item in his hand and threw it back to its owner. That isn't natural, his brother mumbled to himself, before turning to Griffith. You really need to be careful if you're planning on keeping it close to yourself. Guts had been waiting for the right opportunity to ask Griffith a question that had been eating at him. He recognized his chance as they all were longing for a change in subject. Why did you come back to save us, he asked. That seems like an incredible risk for a leader to take for only two of his people. Griffith leveraged himself up to dry off in the morning sun as he thought of his answer. You two are too valuable to me to waste in such a petty battle. You belong to me now and I will decide where you will die. At this point the sun was hitting Griffith from behind at such an intensity that he almost seemed to have an ethereal glow around him. Guts was finding himself almost hypnotized by the mere presence his commander seemed to possess. I will get my own kingdom and you will help me fight to earn it. The moment was broke as Naruto gave a snort before looking up at Griffith. I get what you're saying, but you know the moment would be a lot deeper if you weren't completely naked. He cast a quick look down at Griffith's pride and joy before elbowing his brother. That water must be really DMN cold huh Guts. Guts couldn't help laughing before he heard a splash. He looked over to see Griffith holding an empty bucket and his brother dripping wet. Naruto stood there with his eye twitching for a moment before he dived for a free bucket. Griffith was already sprinting for cover while Guts grabbed the third bucket, deciding that it was high time he showed both of them who they were messing with. After the water fight had broken up, which in his opinion, Guts had definitely won, the boys had drifted their separate ways. Guts had needed some privacy to reflect on everything he had heard that day and had found the small dock by the moat a perfect place to do so. The man only has about 500 mercenaries and he says he'll get himself a kingdom like it's a sure thing. He's only about my age, yet he's so confident. Guts looked up at the sky, watching a few birds skimming over the tree lean. What have I been doing the last few years, he thought to himself. Naruto and I have just been running from one battlefield to the next. Just killing enemies and surviving. He paused as he heard footsteps rushing down the tower stairs, only to be thrown into the water as the tower door was slammed open right behind him. Rickert stared in horror as he realized that he had just dumped his savior into the castle moat. I'm sorry Mr. Guts, he exclaimed. I just wanted to congratulate you on your promotion. I heard you already have ten men placed under you after being a hawk for only a month. That's just amazing. He reached a hand out to help Guts out of the water. Guts stared at the hand, contemplating the offer for a moment. Just call me Guts, he said as he took the boy's hand. He began to climb up before he noticed a shadow envelope Rickert. Pippin came walking out of the stairwell, knocking Rickert and Guts both back into the moat. Casca watched the comedy from the ramparts above them. She resisted cracking a smile at the group's antics, holding herself to a higher standard. The Hawks had definitely become more lively with the addition of the brothers, but she still wasn't able to decide on if it was worth having them around yet. She looked to the side as saw another set of birds taking off from the trees, closer to the castle this time. 
Naruto had decided that some exercise was the best way to dry off after the water fight that he had most definitely won. He had gathered his gear for inventorying and cleaning, when he had discovered that he had left his dagger back on the trail from the battle the night before. The dagger was the last gift he was given from Gambino before he had his breakdown. Besides their last night together, Gambino had been good to Naruto and Guts, showing them how to be both mercenaries, and real men. Naruto refused to lose any more memories of his past after not remembering the first four years of his life. Hey, he called to the gate sentry, I'm going out to search the trail. Let anyone know if they're looking for me. The sentry waved down from his elevated position, before signaling for the gates to be opened for his fellow hawk. Naruto had walked for about half an hour before he found the location of he and his brother's last stand. Body parts laid all over the road and the stench was almost enough to make one wretch. The denizens of the forest had already begun to remove what parts they could reach through the armor. He spied sunlight reflecting off of his dagger sticking out of the back of the neck of a body near the bottom of the main pile of corpses. He spent the next few minutes unpiling bodies to where he could reach his weapon before yanking it out of his victim's skull and cleaning it on the body's cloak. He heard a branch snap behind him and saw a pair of birds startle and take off from a tree above him. He whirled around towards the noise, still brandishing his dagger while moving his other hand towards his axe. Show yourselves, he ordered in a suppressed growl. There wasn't any need to alert the whole forest to the growing conflict if he could avoid it. A shape detached itself from the darkness of the trees, resolving itself into a man cautiously walking towards the blonde with his arms raised away from his sword. I know you, the man mumbled, you were the one who blew up our command tent during the battle. He paused a few feet from the blonde before offering a small smile and lowering his arms. Thank you from all of us foot soldiers for that, he said, offering his hand to Naruto to shake. They had been abusing us worse and worse as the supplies ran down and the stress worsened. Naruto grinned and scratched his head in embarrassment before taking the offered hand for a quick shake. It's no problem. Considering our raids were what caused your situation, I'm glad some good came out of it. What is it that you want from me though if you aren't interested in fighting? He relaxed his stance, though he kept his hands near his weapons in case of any signs of betrayal. It was the man's turn to look embarrassed this time as he tried to figure out how to word his request. First off, my name is Jared. You probably don't remember me, but we met last night and even spoke briefly. I was the first sentry to lay down my arms and lead the rest of the guys off through the forest after you gave us safe passage. Unfortunately we're now deserters. And the army won't take us back. I had the idea of possibly joining up with the band of the hawk, but the rest of the guys said I was crazy for even considering it. I'm just glad I found you or I would have had to risk going to the castle to contact your group. Naruto made a split-second decision, judging Jared to be trustworthy enough to at least give a chance. Go gather up whatever gear and supplies you have, and meet me here again in one hour. I'll have an answer by then on whether you can join up. The two parted ways with Naruto running back to the castle to locate Griffith. He found his leader sitting at a table near the castle stables with Judo, Casca, Corcus, and Pippin, finalizing the hawk's next plans due to their contract ending with the local lord. Griffith. Naruto said with a huff, trying to catch his breath after his sprint. What do I do if a former enemy wants to join up with the hawks? We can't take in former enemies. Casca interjected before her commander could say anything. Griffith frowned at the interruption, but let his commander speak hoping to get the opinion of one of his trusted people. Who knows what their motives might be. They could just be looking for an easy way to take revenge for their loss. Naruto gave her a deadpan look before talking to her very slowly and clearly, as if to a child or a mentally slow adult. You do realize that my brother and I were force recruited at Sword Point after you ambushed us just last month right? Where the F was that logic then? Corcus couldn't hold back his laughter anymore. He was loving watching the normally strict woman be brought down a peg in the most humiliating way possible. He shut his mouth, almost biting his tongue in his haste as Casca turned towards him, 
looking for an outlet to release her rage, knowing that trying anything on the blonde was a lost cause. Naruto turned back to Griffith, knowing he had his full attention now. I'm not saying to trust him immediately, but how the hell else is the hawk supposed to grow if we don't take in defeated enemies? Think about it, they come already trained, most have their gear already, and they're already suitably intimidated by us from earlier defeats to try to attempt anything. If you want to reach your kingdom, then you'll need an army to reach it, he finished, giving Griffith a look of significance. Griffith could see Naruto's point, but wanted to add some stipulations on the idea considering he had the last word in who joined. I'll allow defeated enemies to join, he offered, shooting Casca a look to shut her up before she could start complaining, but we won't force anyone to join except in extreme circumstances. He offered a nod to Naruto, recognizing the unusually circumstances of the blonde's recruitment. If they volunteer to join, then they're to be treated like any other recruit with trust earned over time and merit. He stood up, effectively ending the meeting, and walked around the table to Naruto. Where is the man wanting to join, and who is he? Naruto threw a thumb back over his shoulder to the woods that could be seen through the open gate. I told him to meet me back at the final battleground, where you rescued Guts and me the night before. It's not like he's able to come back with me to the castle with me, the guards would kill him on sight. You guys have actually met him before, he was the guard we spared that told us where the command tent was last night. Griffith indeed remembered the man, appreciating that guard had enough common sense to recognize his position instead of dying like a fanatic. Finish gathering the men, he ordered his commanders. Let's move on to our next job. I've hopefully found us a steady line of work with Midland's army. We can gather our new recruit on the way. Everyone rushed off to perform their duties. There was an excitement in the air for the band of the hawk. They had finally gathered enough fame to be recognized as possible assets by national armies, and Griffith was throwing them in with the side losing the war. Desperation breeds vultures, and the hawks would have plenty of opportunities in the future to elevate themselves on the battlefield. The sound of horses could be heard thundering down the dirt path away from the castle again, though this time in the opposite direction, towards the lands in the distance. Naruto rode ahead of the front line, acting as a scout as they approached the meeting point for himself and Jared. He spotted the man waiting on the side of the road, trying to put as much distance between himself and the leftover gore from the battle as possible. Griffith signaled for his men to halt, before riding forward to meet his new subordinate who was talking to Naruto. Griffith, this is Jared. He's looking to join our merry band. Jared bowed to Griffith, much to Naruto's mirth and his new commander's ire, unknowingly treating him like any other lord he had worked for instead of a mercenary leader. I'm sorry Naruto, but there's been some complications since we spoke. Naruto frowned at the man, knowing that his reputation was on the line as well after vouching for him. What is this complication that you speak of? Griffith asked as he dismounted his horse and took over the conversation. Jared cast a quick look over his shoulder at the woods, causing the other two to grow alarmed and move their hands towards their weapons. No, no. It's nothing like that, he said, trying to defuse the situation. When I went back to my camp to gather my supplies like Naruto instructed, I ran into the rest of the guards that I had deserted with. They hadn't thought that I could actually get into the hawks, and asked to join as well when they heard the news. They're waiting a few hundred feet down the road so as not to surprise you. Naruto blinked at the news, before turning to Griffith. Well that's good news right? A few dozen more men for the hawks couldn't do anything but help. Griffith could feel a headache coming on as he thought over the situation. He was beginning to understand that no situation with the blonde was ever going to be as simple as it was initially presented. Jared cleared his throat, grabbing his commander's attention again, much to Naruto's relief. Actually, it's not a couple dozen men. You see, my friends returned to their camps, and word spread to others who had left the army after the battle. There's actually about 500 men waiting to join down around the next bend. They're all armed, but only about half of them have provisions and horses. The rest lost theirs in the flames. 
Naruto could feel Griffith staring a hole in the back of his head as he jogged down the trail to peek around the edge of the turn. He could see men lining both sides of the road, waiting silently. He ran back to the meeting point at top speed, noticing that the rest of the commanders had pulled forwards as well to hear what was going on. So, he's not lying, Naruto offered sheepishly as he scratched the back of his head. The road is thick with men right around the corner waiting to join. He coughed a few times as Casca's glare was turned full force on him, making him want to hide behind something. You're welcome, he mumbled to Griffith as he walked by the commander on his way back to his horse. He indicated for Jared to mount up and follow him, taking pity on the poor man and removing him from the awkward situation. Griffith took a moment to calm down, promising himself that he would have a talk with Naruto later to remind him about who was in charge and who was. The subordinate. He pushed all of his feelings down, and re-established his commander's presence again before setting his horse forwards in a trot around the bend. He immediately felt hundreds of eyes fall on him as he rode forwards a few paces before stopping to address the assembled men. I'm told that you are looking for a new purpose for your lives. The band of the hawk can offer that for all that are interested. We are a family and look out for each other. Your happiness is my happiness, and your pain is my pain. Follow me if you are ready to take the first step towards greatness. The assembled men erupted in applause, his own men behind joining in as well. He paused, letting the cheers from the men die down, a devious thought floating to the surface in his head. I want all of the new recruits to report to Naruto after you get settled in this evening, he said, looking over his shoulder and indicating the blonde who had a confused look on his face. He'll take an inventory of what everyone needs to become combat able and what you need for camp supplies. Take all of your problems to him until further notice. He watched the blonde's face fall farther and farther as he continued, barely able to hold in his laughter and stay professional. A grinning casca slapped the blonde on the back while she rode forwards as the rest of the hawks began to travel again, the recruits joining the veterans on the trail. Guts rode forwards to his brother, unable to resist giving him a strong time. You know this wouldn't have happened if you hadn't made fun of his pp size after the water fight right? As the blonde woodenly turned his head towards his brother, Guts nodded to himself as if realizing some great concept. I don't feel nearly as bad now about having to look after ten men, considering you have five hundred to handle. He took off with a cackle as he heard his brother's sword sliding from its sheath, riding forwards to join Judo and Pippin as they mocked the blonde for the rest of the ride. Five years later. Green hills rolled as far as the eye could see. A breeze blew between the hills, playing with the wildflowers that grew in random patches. A tree sat alone on top of one of the hills, throwing up a shadow over a single figure taking shelter from the rising heats cast by the early afternoon sun. Judo sat, perched in the lower branches of the tree, using the view it afforded him to watch the status of the battle between the armies of Midland and Chudder. The flow of the battle seemed to be even at the moment, one side would surge, only for the other to rally and surge back. The ground was turning to mud, saturated with the BLD from the bodies of both sides piling up under foot and ground into the soil under heel. A horn could be heard blowing from the Chudder command post in one of the back hills. Judo sighed to himself as he watched a dark mass flow over the hills one by one, resolving into knights decked out in black armor with ram horns on their helmets and wielding vicious lances and riding armored steeds. Someone on Chudder's side must be getting bored, he thought to himself as he watched the ensuing slaughter. The Black Ram Iron Lance heavy cavalry crashed into the flank of the Midland army with a crash that could be heard for miles, effectively drowning out the screams of its victims. Those that weren't speared on the lances, were ground under their horses' hoofs. The first soldier turned and fled, soon followed by another, then another. In minutes, a well-organized defense turned into a route leaving a wide-open path towards Midland's command post, where its generals and king himself viewed the battle in mounting horror. Judo had been ordered by Griffith to watch for a moment like this. He was to signal the hawks who had laid in wait one hill over, letting them know the perfect time to intervene in the battle to let them gain maximum credit for saving the day. 
As the commander of the Black Rams reformed his cavalry for the final charge, Judo prepared to send the signal before he spied two figures standing in the middle of the field between the rams and the command post. What the hell? Oh God DMN it. He thought to himself as he recognized exactly who the figures were. You get five minutes he silently told them, then I'm calling in the rest. Naruto looked out the corner of his eye at his brother as they sat on their horses, side by side on the field. Five years had done both of the brothers a world of good by the time PBRTY had hit them. Both of them had become taller than DMN near anyone else in the Hawks, with Guts topping out at 6 feet 1 inch and Naruto at 6 foot even. Guts was noticeably thicker in muscle, to correspond with his sword that he had increased in size to match his body's growth. He was so powerful now, that he didn't even need a real edge to his sword his strength and the sword's momentum were enough to cut through DMN near anything. Naruto had stayed leaner but still had enough power to weather his brother's attacks, if not push back against them. His speed had increased though to the point where his attacks looked like blurs to the average eye. Only those that constantly dueled him were able to predict his movements enough to last against him for a prolonged PRD of time. Guts's lust for battle had only increased as he aged. He was fast becoming a combat junkie, unable to even consider life past the next fight. Only Naruto and Griffith were able to keep him grounded in their own ways. This had to lead to many uncomfortable moments with other hawks like Casca who couldn't stand Guts abandoning plans and formations to go off and battle singularly. One of those moments was happening now Naruto reflected to himself as he watched his brother prepare to meet the charge of the approaching rams. Remind me to kick your butt for dragging me out here later, he gripped at his brother. Now I have to listen to Casca for not keeping you responsible to your unit and the overall plan. Relax big brother, Guts offered with a small smirk. He loved addressing Naruto with that title now that he was finally visibly larger than him. No one forced you out here with me. I just want to meet these elites of Chudder in battle before the Hawks sweep them away. You know this is what I do best. He felt his BLD begin to pump harder as the enemy closed in, his brain's higher functions shut down one by one as his body shifted fully into battle mode. His smile began to grow wider and wilder as his excitement built. I'm here because you're here you dumb SHT, Naruto responded back blandly, getting an angry snort from his brother. I can't let you into a battle like this without watching your back. Think about that next time you risk both of our lives for something stupid like. You're not even f listening to me are you? Guts chose that moment to slap Naruto's horse's flank sending it forward, before immediately charging after while drawing his gigantic blade. It's only two horsemen against the entire black ram heavy iron cavalry. Mow them down, ordered the commander as he shot towards the blonde rider in the lead, leaving the black-haired swordsman for his lieutenants and their men. Naruto narrowed his eyes as the enemy commander veered towards him. He had made quite a name for himself over the years always trying to target the enemy leaders on the battlefield. He always aimed for the least loss of life on the battlefield, and in his view, decapitating the enemy leadership ended the fight quicker than anything else. Usually he had to navigate the battlefield to locate them, but every now and then he got lucky and one of them came right to him like this dumbass. The ram's commander closed the distance, setting his lance into his shoulder and setting his body to brace for impact. This was the moment Naruto was waiting for, as the blonde wing throwing knife at the commander, bouncing it off of his helmet with enough force to throw his head back. The commander reflexively dropped his lance as he grabbed at his helmet in panic at the unexpected attack. The blonde had reached the commander at his moment of distraction allowing him to take a mighty swing with his sword, decapitating the man's head. To the horror of the rams, Naruto caught the head as he rode by, before jamming it onto a spike mounted on the back of his saddle. The rams couldn't believe the audacity of the blonde swordsman that had killed their commander and taken such a grisly trophy. Their charge faltered at the worst possible moment as they tried to figure out what to do next. Guts hit them like a tidal wave, his blade cutting through the lieutenant commander and one other in a single swing. He carved a straight line through the entire cavalry before turning around to charge again. 
Naruto had followed his brother through the hole formed by his charge, widening it further as he attacked rams on both sides while protecting his brother's back. The rams at the end of the pack turned away from the battle as they heard a rumble start to get louder. They froze at the sight of the entire band of the hawk surging around the base of the king's hill heading straight towards their enemy with the white hawk Griffith in the lead. The hawks were on them in moments, slaughtering anyone that they could reach. The rams turned to retreat, only to face Naruto and Guts still fighting at their back, bottlenecking their route of retreat. Less than an hour later, only a handful of rams had managed to flee the battlefield with the Cheddar army that had retreated at the sight of their elite unit being truly decimated. Griffith rode towards the brothers as the battle wound down, taking off his helmet and offering a smile and a thumbs up to his heavy hitters. Guts offered a tired smile back with his sword propped up on his shoulder. He was covered in BLD, though very little of it was actually his thanks to the efforts of his brother. Naruto looked pissed off at his brother, unable to comprehend why they had to put themselves in so much danger. Guts dismounted his horse and was about to greet Griffith when he felt something heavy smash against the back of his helmet. He turned to see the head of the ram's commander rolling away on the ground and Naruto wiping his hand off on a cloth. What the hell Naruto, he shouted as he stomped towards his brother, slamming his forehead into the blondes as they stared eye to eye. You know I hate it when you throw severed heads at me. What the hell was that for? Because you dragged me into a battle we didn't need to fight alone you dumb sht. Naruto responded before shoving his brother back a few feet. You know DMN well that the plan called for us to attack the enemy from the sides trapping them, yet you still rode out alone, making me follow. So I'll throw as many heads at you as I want until you stop being stupid. Naruto picked up another random head, still in its helmet, before flinging it at his brother, nailing him right in the face. That's it. I'm kicking your butt, big brother, shouted Guts as he threw down his sword and charged the blonde, spearing him with his shoulder and sending both of them down into the dirt. He maneuvered his way on top of the blonde's back before getting him in a headlock and digging his knuckles into Naruto's scalp. Casca rode up in a huff, ready to light into Guts for his lone wolf move when she saw the brothers rolling around on the ground. Naruto already handling talking to Guts, she asked Griffith, who was calmly watching the fight. At his nod, she turned to walk away, shouting over her shoulder, get him for me too Naruto. A hand shot out of the tangle, giving her a thumbs up, before it was pulled back into the battle. Griffith watched her leave before turning back to the fight, seeing Naruto laying under Guts with his legs wrapped around Guts' bicep while he held the other one with both arms, trapping his brother in a crucifix-style hold. I'm not the same man I was those years ago, Guts mumbled as he relaxed into the hold, realizing he couldn't break it. I care about my men, and I care about the hawks. I know little brother, Naruto said as began to release Guts now that the fight had worn out of him. None of us are the same kids that we were back then, we've all grown and matured. All of us except for, Mr. Man Pretty over there, he said inclining his head towards their friend who had been waiting patiently for them. Griffith calmly offered Guts a hand, before pulling him up to his feet. He then took out his water skin and poured it over the blonde's head before pulling him to his feet as well. They walked back towards their camp in a comfortable silence. One week later. Naruto watched Guts practicing with his sword in the courtyard of the cathedral. Griffith was to be knighted by the king in a ceremony inside, giving him the rank of Viscount and allowing the band of the Hawk to become actual soldiers in the army instead of having to stay as mercenaries. Is there a reason you aren't going inside, asked Naruto as he sat on the rail and watched his brother practice. From what I can see, you came prepared to. He nudged Gut's armor with his foot where it had been cast aside on the ground. He doesn't need us for this, grunted Guts as he completed his 200th swing of his weighted sword. We're there to support him in battle, not politics. He switched hands, ready to start the count over with his off hand. Ah, but there's where you're wrong, Naruto corrected him as he jumped down and started to redress his brother in his armor. Politics is just another form of battle, and if you're serious in helping him and the Hawks, then you need to support him on this battlefield too. When he looks back, he needs to see that we are all there for him. 
He slapped Guts on the arm before gesturing towards the chapel door. Come on, let's go inside and hide in the back to avoid Casca. We can hide your sword behind that big plant near the entrance since you can't go in armed. The brothers entered the church swiftly and silently, their many years as mercenaries reflecting on their skill. They took a spot along the back wall just in time to see Casca who was obviously looking for them. She could only glare impotently due to the distance between them, causing Naruto to grin and wave at the all-too-serious girl. The rest of the nobles hadn't noticed them enter and proceeded to carry on their whispered conversations. The common consensus was that the knighting of a mercenary was a complete break in decorum and a travesty to both the nobles' positions of power as well as the realm in general. Naruto took note of the few nobles who spoke out in favor of tying the hawks officially to Midland through titles, marking them down in his mind as possible future allies for Griffith. The ceremony was wrapping up and Griffith stood to receive congratulations from the crowd for his new title. He nodded to his commanders in the front row, but he grew a beaming smile when he saw the brothers in the back of the church clapping for him. He hadn't realized just how much it meant to him for them to show up in support until just now. Six months. Later. The overcast sky darkened the land beneath it, giving the castle an ominous look. Griffith rolled the behelot around in his hand as he watched his hawk spread over the enemy fortress like ants attacking a free meal. Whenever he held the charm, he couldn't help but think back to the day he had told Naruto and Guts about his dream of achieving his own kingdom. The behelot had opened an eye as if it was inspecting each of the boys, but only Griffith didn't have an odd reaction to it. He took that as a sign that he was the only one of the three who had what it took to achieve his dream. He had just been updated by a runner that the fortress was all but taken with the exception of the enemy citadel. There was an enemy of great strength holding the hawks back from getting to the enemy lord, but Guts and Naruto were both looking into the matter personally with their men. Zod. Judo mumbled from behind Griffith catching his and the rest of his commander's attention. Noticing their looks, Judo clarified what he said. I had heard a rumor before we had set out that the Nisferata Zod had joined the enemy forces. He gave a half-hearted chuckle as he looked up at his companions. Something tells me that if Guts ran into him, he'd go charging headlong into the battle like a madman. The others laughed seeing the humor in it, but Griffith began to grow panicked as he realized the truth to the statement. A flash of lightning illuminated two figures, taller than the rest of the men go charging into the castle. Griffith grasped the reins on his horse and charged down the hill, alarmed shouts of his subordinates echoing behind him. He had to make it in time. Guts was besides himself as he waited in the courtyard of the castle that the hawks had been tasked to capture for Midland. More responsibility had been move on the berserker as he grew older and his accomplishments added up. He was now in charge of a 500-man group called the Raiders who all looked to him for direction. The Raiders followed their leader's example in warfare, they were the first hawks into battle, and the last ones out. Only those who excelled in strength, stamina, and skill were able to meet the standards that the Raiders imposed on themselves with the weak being encouraged to move on to other leaders. The men were his extended family and he cared for each of his raiders, which was why he couldn't handle not knowing the fates of fifty of his best men who were inside the citadel searching for the enemy commander. A loud thud behind him caused Guts to jump and whirl around, looking for any threats. He spotted a body, obviously a noble judging by the BLD stained fine clothes, lying in a heap a few feet away from him. He looked up to where the corpse had come from, only to see Naruto scaling down the stone wall using a curtain from one of the upper windows, jumping the last ten feet to land next to his brother. The blonde gave the corpse a quick kick, as he looked over to Guts. That's the castle lord there. The rest of his family had been evacuated already. We just need to mop up now. Guts never knew exactly how his brother got away with what he did. Naruto had managed to dump the 500 men he was responsible for over the same time that Guts had accumulated his. The blonde style of fighting didn't mesh with large-scale combat, making it undesirable for him to lead a large number of troops. No one could keep an eye on him if he didn't want you to, there one second and gone the next. 
The amazing thing though was that all of the men that had been in Naruto's care remained heavily loyal to him, even after splitting off into other formations in the Hawks. His personality and dedication to those he worked with ensured their loyalty even years later. Guts shook his head as he looked at his brother's handiwork, the Lord had been worked over before being finished off. He looked up suddenly, hearing a shuffling noise growing nearer to the group. He followed the direction of his brother's gaze towards the entrance to the keep. To his mounting horror, one of his most trusted men, Dillos, stumbled out of the building. The man's eyes were somewhere far away as he concentrated on continuing to move forwards in a straight line. He was missing his entire left arm from the shoulder down, and clearly in shock as his face grew ashen and his BLD loss mounted. Guts caught him as he pitched forward, turning him over to face the sky. Nesferatu. Zod. Was the only words Dillos was able to get out before succumbing to his injuries. His last moments of life spent trying to warn his fellows of the danger ahead. A shadow fell over Guts's face as he lowered Dillos's body to the ground and slowly stood up, staring at the entrance to the keep. He knew enough of his brother's tactics to understand his man was allowed to stumble outside and die as a message to the rest of the castle's attackers. Normally he could respect such tactics, but this had been done to his man. Someone who he was responsible to watch over and protect. If there was one lesson that Naruto had hammered home into his skull over the years, it was, always protect those important to you, and he considered his men to be his extended family. If one died in battle, he could accept it. This though, was not something he would let stand. Keep back, he ordered his men as they made to follow him towards the keep. Nobody come with me. I'm killing him alone. Ah f. Naruto muttered to himself as he watched his brother slowly succumb to his bloodlust as his rage built. He made to follow his brother, only to be stopped by Guts's raiders. Sorry Naruto but Captain Guts said he doesn't want anyone following him, said Guts's Lieutenant Gaston, the poor man squaring his shoulders as he knew he could very well be staring death in the eye. The rest of the raiders gathered behind him, determined to do what their captain ordered, even against one of the most dangerous men they had ever met. Naruto couldn't help but admire the dedication Guts inspired in his men, though this was one of the worst times for it to manifest. You all realize that you're keeping me from backing my brother up right? At their hesitant nods he continued, and that he is possibly fighting against someone who is functionally immortal and has never lost a battle. Again they all nodded silently in affirmation. Then we have a serious problem here. Unknowingly to himself, his whisker marks on his cheeks began to darken, intimidating those who stood in his path. You all know my policy for dealing with my problems. Gaston backed away a step as another of the men visibly gulped, sweat running down their features. They all held their hands close to their weapons, ready to defend themselves, but no one wanting to be the first to draw on the second deadliest man in the band of the hawk. All of a sudden Naruto loosened his posture, plastering a giant smile on his face to the confusion of the group in front of him. Luckily you lot are on my do not kill list thanks to my brother. As the men began to relax, the blonde let two black balls slip from his hand that he had been palming earlier. As they hit the ground, a bright flash blinded everyone in the area. When the others regained their eyesight moments later, they realized that Naruto was nowhere to be seen. Gaston pushed through the raiders to the front of the keep. The body of the enemy commander had been propped up against the wall by a few daggers, one armed pointing down the hall towards the faint sounds of battle. Naruto's message clear for everyone on where he had gone. Naruto made his way down the darkened corridor, doing his best not to disturb the corpses thrown all over as if they were children's discarded dolls. The light from the torches on the walls barely illuminated more than a few feet of space, leaving most of the hall to be enshrouded in darkness and shadows. A loud crash could be heard farther down the hall. Interesting. A deep voice rumbled, barely audible over Naruto's own breathing as his adrenaline began to spike. You parried that strike well boy. Naruto rounded a pillar before stopping dead in his tracks, stunned at what he was seeing. Guts was down on one knee, 
his sword propping him up as BLD dribbled down the side of his face from a cut on his forehead. Across the clearing from him was a man that had to be at least ten feet tall and twice as wide across the shoulders as Guts was himself. Pure muscle covered every last inch of the man, and he used that term loosely due to the somewhat elongated facial features and tusks. The sword the stranger, who Naruto was now realizing could only be Zod, was a huge, curved, single-edged blade that only Guts's sword could come close to in size. Guts pulled himself back up to his feet, barely able to bring his blade up in time to meet Zod's next furious onslaught of strikes. He found himself trapped on the defensive, barely able to get his sword in the way of the next blow, let alone finding the balance and timing to counter-attack. He ducked under a powerful roundhouse blow from the beast man, the sword shattering the pillar behind HM instead of his skeleton. The follow-up underhand blow was too powerful for him to keep his footing though, picking him up and sending him flying back into the pillar. Guts slid to the ground, nursing his side as he counted at least one broken rib poking into something important inside of him. He knew his chances were diminishing as his mobility became compromised. Zod's excitement was growing as the battle continued. No one has lasted against me this long in battle for over fifty years, he said with glee. He knew he had the upper hand in the fight after the last bout, but couldn't help but want to elongate the first real fight he'd had in decades. His tunnel vision brought on by the battle was beginning to recede at this point, allowing him to notice things he had blocked out before, like the fact that it was noticeably darker in the hall than it was before. The lights on the pillars directly surrounding himself still burned, but the last few lights dimmed and went out as he watched a shadowy figure overturn the holders. Who dares interrupt my battle, he roared out into the darkness. A whistling sound behind him gave him just enough warning to duck a pike that had been hurled at high speed, the blade burying the first foot of itself in the pillar behind him. That would have been powerful enough to split my head open, he thought to himself as he regarded the darkness with more caution. Knives flew out of the darkness to his side, expertly aimed at his face and neck. Zod noticed that they were meant to drive him away from his current opponent so he responded by planting his feet and using the flat of his blade to block them. He was unable to dodge the sword hurled from his left while the knives were still en route. The blade buried itself in his left leg, just above the knee, causing him to grunt in annoyance. I dare interrupt, came a voice from behind Zod, causing him to turn as his hidden assailant finally revealed himself to be a large blond man without a trace of fear in his eyes. You are fighting with my brother there, he nodded towards the swordsman that had captured Zod's attention before dropping into an attack stance. Therefore you're also fighting with me, he shouted as he hurled himself forward towards the immortal swordsman. Naruto dodged under Zod's initial strike, the blade coming close enough to give him an unintended haircut. He jumped in the air in front of the giant, kicking him in the face before raising his blade to stab him in the neck. His attack never happened though, the immortal recovering surprisingly quickly before backhanding him in the jaw with such strength that it knocked Naruto silly and sent him flying back into the darkness. You are not worthy of participating in this battle, Zod mumbled as he turned back towards the swordsman. He had momentarily been disturbed as he caught a close view of the blonde's face, the darkened whisker marks and slit pupils giving Naruto a knower demonic appearance. This had caused Zod to hit him with much more strength than he had been holding back so far, picking up the increased threat the blonde represented. His excitement returned as he witnessed the swordsman prepare for a power strike, leaving himself wide open to attack. Zod couldn't help but comment on what was coming, you're counting on your blade's length to make a difference but your brains will be on the floor long before it touches me. At the swordsman's continued resolve, he brought himself up into an overhead attack, all of his power ready to unleash itself in the blow. I accept, he roared out, charging forwards. The swords met with not a titanic crash, sharp ping as Zod's blade was shorn clean through. Guts spun with the swing, bringing his sword up and around to an overhead swing before sinking it straight down deep into Zod's shoulder. Guts was only allowed a moment of triumph before Zod grabbed the offending blade with his bare hand and slowly pulling it out of his shoulder. The immortal raised the remaining part of his blade with deliberate slowness, relishing the panic in his opponent's eyes. 
His revenge was interrupted as a hand axe was driven into his lower back, nicking his spine and taking away all feeling from below his waist. As he fell to his knees, he felt someone jump on his back before driving a sword blade into each side of the junction of his neck and chest. Zod pitched forwards onto his face, a loud groan leaving his body. As his eyesight began to dim, he barely managed to pick up a head of blonde hair as the man walked away from him towards the swordsman. Naruto breathed out a sigh of relief as he slowly limped over to his brother. The blonde knew his right leg was broken in at least two places. He had taken a valuable moment during Guts's fight to make a crude splint out of a bet and a broken spear, before rejoining his brother. You aren't taking his head. Guts questioned as he used the wall behind himself to stand back up again. Naruto just shook his head as he motioned for them to move towards the exit. The only thing he wanted was to get the hell out of the keep, before using his explosives to bring it down on Zod and bury him once and for all. He had only made it a few feet before a huge clawed hand, covered in red fur, closed around his waist and legs. Turning around his upper body, he had a perfect view of Zod reaching back to pull the axe from his back, before leveraging himself to his feet with his free hand. The immortal was changing before the brother's eyes. Zod's false human form had been discarded. He now towered almost thirty feet high and covered in dark red fur, needing to stoop to fit in what had been considered a high-ceilinged room before. His features had become more demonic with an elongated muzzle with razor-sharp fangs, glowing yellow eyes, and huge black horns growing out of his head. Guts drew back in fear from the demon, its very presence stifling the room and making it difficult to breathe, let alone. Function. Zod cracked his neck before craning it to look down at the blonde that had incapacitated him so thoroughly. Naruto had reached out towards his brother, looking for help. Guts made it over but was unable to reach his brother before he was kicked back into the pillar by Zod. He could only watch helplessly as Naruto was driven head first into the ceiling by the demon. His brother's head lolled to the side as he was lowered back down with his eyes still open, the lights on but nobody home. Guts pushed himself to his feet, picking up his sword again, determined to save his brother. Zod seeing this, slammed Naruto into a pillar twenty feet off the ground, before picking up the remaining portion of his sword and slamming it into the Naruto's stomach, pinning him to the wall. You and I have unfinished business, he addressed the blonde who had returned to lucidity from the pain. Stick around until I finish my battle and we'll see how good you are without being able to attack me from the shadows. And you, he spun around, looking straight at Guts, the swordsman staring in shock at his invincible big brother being brought so low. The demon smiled sinisterly at the swordsman, I haven't had a battle like this in over three hundred years. This is the reason I've lived for so long. Show me what you can do. Guts was beaten black and blue over the next few minutes. His one hit bounced straight off of Zod's horns. The swordsman was swatted with the demon's hands all over the room until he was barely able to move. As he lay against a pillar trying to catch his breath, he was picked up by his shoulders by the demon and brought in front of his face. Was that it? asked the demon, frustration clear in his voice. I guess you've done well for a human, but I won't show you any mercy. Naruto could only stare helplessly as the demon began to squeeze his brother, guts crying out in agony. The blonde's pulse began to pnd in his ear as his body began to stir. A hail of arrows interrupted Zod's attack, pincushioning his arms and back. Looking back towards the hall's entrance, he spotted a line of hawks reloading crossbows, with Griffith and his lieutenants behind them staring in horror at the demon who was holding one of their strongest members like a rag doll while the other was pinned to a pillar next to them. Panic was beginning to set it, but a quick order to fire a second volley from Griffith returned their focus to the present. Zod dropped guts as he moved to protect his eyes from the volley, rage beginning to build as more puny humans tried to intercede in the greatest battle he had in centuries. I won't have this. He said, turning fully towards the hawks. No one may defile this battle. I won't have it, he roared as he charged headlong into the scared mass of soldiers. Naruto watched in horror as the hawks, his friends, were slaughtered by the demon. 
His pulse was now pounding in his head as his vision began to go black from the BLD loss. He could still hear the sounds of the battle though. Griffith had ordered his lieutenants to gather the remaining men and retreat back to the exit. While the retreat took Zod's attention, he sprinted over to Guts and hoisted the larger man up on his shoulder despite his protests to leave him be and run. A shadow fell over them as they noticed the silence in the hall. The retreat had finished, and Zod towered over the only two men in any fighting shape. Where do you think you are going? he asked Guts rhetorically. You are still breathing, so fight, he lunged at the two men, almost too quick to counter. Guts and Griffith shoved off of each other, choosing to draw the beast's attention in multiple directions at once. The plan worked perfectly, allowing Griffith to score a deep cut along Zod's right arm, while Guts lopped off Zod's left arm completely a little above the elbow. Zod didn't take the attack lying down though. The hawk's leader was still recovering when he heard Casca scream out his his name from the tunnel entrance. He looked up just in time for Zod's tail to smack into his chest strong enough to break ribs and send him flying into a pillar. The white-haired man sank to the ground unconscious from the blow. Guts lost all sense at the sight of his leader going down. Griffith, he shouted as he ran towards the man, only to get intercepted by Zod. The demon had picked up his own severed arm and used it as an improvised club to smack Guts into the ground with bone-jarring force. Guts's tortured scream was the last thing Naruto remembered as unconsciousness overtook him. His mind refused to give up, even as his body refused to respond. Deep in a dark cave, behind a smashed gate, a single red eye sleepily opened. It noticed the lighting beginning to dim, and realized the cause as it had experienced it before. It's still too early for us to have our meeting boy, it said in as its eye began to slowly close again, the act of coming awake having exhausted the beast. Take this and show the lesser demon who the Alpha truly is. A single red thendril of energy whisked away from the creature and entered the empty pipes running in the ceiling. They thrummed to life causing the entire cave and the surrounding tunnels to grow in an angry red color. Zod towered over Guts, determined to end this human once and for all before any more interruptions could happen. He stopped cold as familiar presence descended on him from nearby. The feeling of a greater demon, as powerful as his master's could be felt faintly, as if from a great distance. He straightened up as his arm reattached itself, his demonic healing factor kicking in. He was unable to find the demon in the hall, and was about to give it up before he set eyes on the blonde hanging from the pillar. Naruto had raised his head up and was glaring directly at Zod with glowing red eyes. His hair was frayed out behind him and his whisker marks had thickened even more as they grew to the back of his cheeks. The blonde growled before letting out a shout infused with enough demonic energy to force Zod to take a step back and brace from the power. The sword fell from Naruto's chest as he dropped to the ground, the whole healing up before Zod's eyes. Naruto picked up his discarded axe and sword before dropping into a stance, low to the ground, ready to pounce in an instant. Zod matched the stance, both beings growling at each other, before they charged. Naruto jumped over Zod's outstretched claws, raising high enough to knee the demon directly in the snout and slash at his eyes with his axe. Casca watched the battle from farther up the tunnel with Pippin, Juddo, and Rickon. From their perspective, Zod had flattened Guts and Griffith before turning towards something out of their line of sight. Zod roared and charged off to the side, before a smack was heard and the demon fell back to the ground in front of them, reeling with one hand while he protected his eyes with the other. BLD could be seen pouring from behind his paw. Casca and Juddo took the moment to run in and grab Guts and Griffith from under their arms, pulling them back towards the entrance. They looked up in time to see Naruto stumble into view, looking more feral than they had ever seen him before, when the man suddenly collapsed like all of his energy had left his body. Pippin grabbed his leg, pulling him out of reach of the thrashing demon, before tossing him over his broad shoulders and running for the entrance after the others. Zod pulled his paw away from his now healed eyes, a scar now going across. His snout and both eye sockets. He noticed his prey being carried away and moved to give chase, only to come up short as his eyes fell on Griffith. 
The behelet had fallen out from behind the man's armor as he was being pulled away, swngng across his chest by the chain it was connected to. The egg of the king, the demon muttered in reverence. A cub like him with the crimson behelet? His eyes widened in fear of the owners of the behelet, the god hand, he muttered to himself. So that's how it is, he said out loud as he seemed to come to a decision. Zod reared up to his full height, punching a wide hole in the roof, wide enough to allow him to escape. Listen well boy, he said to a barely conscious Guts, feeling he owed the young man something for the magnificent fight. Our battle is on hold for now, but I wonder if I'll ever meet up with you again. Here's a warning, no a prophecy, he indicated towards an unconscious Griffith. If you can be said to be a true friend to this man, then take heed when his ambition collapses death will pay you a visit. A death you can never escape. As he prepared to leave, his eyes trailed over to Naruto, drawing a gasp from the rest of the hawks. Tell that one that I will return to settle our feud. There can only be one alpha. With that, the demon launched himself through the roof into the air. He spread his wings, choosing to simply glide down the mountainside on the air currents, his body too beat up from the last battle to fly comfortably. Griffith, back in the castle, Casca had finally realized that the Donge was all clear and had lowered Griffith to the floor to finally see the extent of the damage done to him. Needless to say, it was bad enough to draw the normally strong woman to near hysterics. Gut stood up under his own power, assuring Judo and his raiders that he was well enough to walk. He slowly shuffled over to his leader, determined to know of the man's status. His inquiry though earned him a surprising slap on the cheek from Casca's armored fist. Don't you touch him, she said as she turned towards Guts with hate in her eyes. This is your fault. This never would have happened to Griffith if it weren't for you. An awkward silence spread over the survivors, no one knowing what to do next and unwilling to direct Casca's wrath towards themselves. Guts stood there stunned as he tried to process the woman's words. Strangely what she said seemed to almost cause him more pain than what he had experienced during the entire battle. The silence was interrupted as Naruto let out a large snore from Pippin's shoulder as he slept on through all of the conflict. Rickon couldn't hold in his snort of laughter, prompting Judo and Corcus to bust up laughing as well. Soon, almost hysterical laughter spread across all of the men as the stress bled off of them. Come on, let's get out of here. Judo suggested, knowing he wasn't in charge, but also aware Casca wouldn't in any condition to lead for a while. Put Griffith on a stretcher, and someone help Guts out, whether he wants it or not. Everyone started to move back towards the courtyard and out of the castle, determined to put the terrible battle behind them. Certain people though would remember the warning though and spend many sleepless nights trying to determine exactly what it meant. It had been a week already since the band of the Hawk had returned to Wyndham Castle, the capital of Midland. The Hawks had been led into the city, but had been forced to find their own lodging and medical care due to being a mercenary band instead of being proper soldiers of the army. Everyone besides Griffith that was, the leader of the Hawks possessing nobility status in Midland. Naruto could have cared less about the politics as long as his people were looked after. Even though he wasn't in charge of them, he had taken Guts's raiders under his wing while his brother was laid up, ensuring that all of them were taken care of and food, medical, and lodging, as well as receiving all of their back pay. It was the little things like that which made Naruto the real second in command of the Hawks in all but name, the title still remained with Casca due to Griffith's unwillingness to demote her without an actual disciplinary issue. It did lead to extra friction between the two though when Casca felt that Naruto encroached on her territory. This didn't stop the men from going to the cheerful blonde first with their issues. Unfortunately Naruto had run out of issues to take care of after the initial, settling PRD, of the Hawks as they switched from active to garrison roles. Casca had finally gotten out of her funk over Griffith's injuries and had taken back the reins of the Hawks, shunting Naruto to the sideline. Now the blonde was left to wander the city surrounding the castle, having been encouraged to leave by the other lieutenants as it was made clear that the nobles were not comfortable with the hawk's infamous headhunter being left without a minder in their midst. 
Naruto's body count over his career of nobles who lead attacks against him was higher than many standing armies. He was the Grim Reaper and the Boogeyman all rolled into one for a noble opposing Midland, and the Cheddar nobles had begun to invest heavily in bodyguards of higher quality. This actually suited Naruto fine as he preferred the life of the common folk over the pomp and fakeness of the royal court. Besides, he thought to himself as he made his way down the main street, they love me for getting to do something they wish they were able to. Taking it to the royals that make the peasants' lives that much tougher for no reason, just because it's their right by BRTH. He stopped at the corner of where the two main streets in the city intersected. This had unofficially become Hawk's territory as it had their favorite favorite inns, shops, and whorehouses all in a few square blocks. This meant that the area also had the Hawk's protection, meaning Naruto always tried to have a few patrols of Hawks in the area, strictly to assist citizens when asked for help. Crimes such as theft and assault had all plummeted when the punishments ranged from a light beating to disappearing outright as the evidence and severity of the crime dictated. Naruto nodded to a few hawks who were loitering outside one of the local pubs, beer mugs in hand, as they watched the local populace move about their business. It was good to see everyone getting along he thought to himself with a somewhat sardonic smile as he watched a shifty-looking man following a woman into an alley, only to be followed by three armed hawks a moment later. Nothing was visible for a few minutes before the hawks walked back out with the woman hanging on one of their arms, looking both frazzled and relieved as she thanked her rescuers. Naruto followed the street down to the market area, pleasantly surprised to find a crowd forming around one of the competition rings, an impromptu fighting melee tournament being organized by a few shop nobles and merchants looking to push their wares and hire any available talent. The crowd began to murmur excitedly as they noticed he was among them. His celebrity was a two-edged sword though as the merchants proceeded to put him on the spot, all but begging him to join up in the fighting. Naruto put up a token resistance, but found himself in the ring facing a giant of a man wielding a mace less than a few minutes later. He knew he was the opening fight and it was almost a requirement to make it flashy instead of an instant takedown. The giant didn't seem to get the memo though, immediately charging in with an overhead swing that could have killed a man in one blow. You know this isn't supposed to be a death match right? Naruto asked under his breath as he pretended to grapple with the man over his weapon for a moment. Let's give them a good show, he said with a smile as he pushed off the man to gain some distance again. The giant paused for a second, considering Naruto's offer. As he scanned the crowd, he began to notice small groups of the band of the hawk interspersed in with the rest of the audience. Their scowls at his blatant killing blow at one of their captains caused him to reconsider his position in a quick way. He nodded in acceptance towards his opponent before moving in much more slowly, cautious of what his opponent could do. Naruto led him around the ring for the next few minutes, allowing him to showcase his skills, before allowing him to overextend himself on a wide swing. Naruto knocked the mace out of his hands, holding to his blade to the man's throat until his surrender was given. The crowd roared in appreciation at the spectacle, offering congratulations to both men and handing them each a beer mug. Naruto raised his in a toast, quickly returned by his opponent before they both quaffed the entire mug in one go. If you don't get picked up by any of the lords, make sure you come by our barracks tomorrow. We're always on the lookout for talent for the band of the hawks. The man looked excited as he walked off, joined by a few of the hawks as they began to share war stories with each other. The other fighters stood a little straighter and looked a little more serious after watching how Naruto handled his opponent. They were well aware that the level of the competition's difficulty had just skyrocketed, but also held the possibility of being headhunted for one of Midland's premier mercenary bands as well. The crowd was treated to special treat that day as the competitors gave it their all, many being offered a place in the various hawk units by groups belonging to different captains. Naruto found himself being brought in to arbitrate a few of the cases, including stopping one fist fight between the raiders and a group of Corcus's men. In between this, Naruto managed to defeat three more fighters without taking any hits himself. One man used a net and spear combo, while the other two made use of long swords. Oh God! He thought as he reflected on his actions, 
I'm becoming a combat junkie like Guts. They were all decently skilled, but after fighting Zod, none of the battles seemed to have as much flavor to keep Naruto interested. Naruto was still kind enough to give them the same deal he gave his first opponent, something that they all eagerly accepted without trouble. Soon enough, Naruto found himself back in the ring, a finalist waiting on his last opponent for the day. The crowd hushed as someone made his way through them, before a blur jumped into the ring across from him. The fighter was clearly foreign, as tall as Naruto but built rail thin. His body was as clearly conditioned for speed and sleight of hand attacks as Guts was for power. Naruto grinned in excitement, recognizing the man's obvious skill even as his opponent assessed him with a veteran's critical eye in return. Their fighting styles would be similar enough that any decision would come down into a matter of skill instead of mismatched physical skill sets as had happened in battles before. Naruto bowed his head to the man, while firmly maintaining eye contact. May I know the name of my final opponent? I'm Naruto from the Band of the Hawk. I know who you are headhunter. Your reputation precedes you wherever you go, the man smiled as he watched his opponent pout at his notoriety was used against him. I must admit to looking forward to this fight as well. My name is Silet and I hail from Kushin. He dropped into a ready stance, one hand out in front of him, while the other held a strange curved blade over and slightly behind his head. Naruto dropped into a similar stance, holding a dagger in each hand as they waited for the other to make the first move. Minutes wore by, no one in the audience made a sound as they waited for the action to begin. At the sound of a child's sneeze, both of the men sprang forward in a blur too fast for the untrained to follow. The sound of metal clashing against metal could be heard as the two men clashed throughout the arena. It was an unspoken agreement that the men wouldn't use any thrown weapons that could hurt the audience surrounding them. This didn't stop caltrips of two different designs to be strewn around the arena though, denying different areas of usage to force the opponent into a position strategically better for their own objectives. The battle finally came to a head as both young men met in the center of the arena, Silet flipping Naruto over his shoulder before kneeling with a blade to the blonde's neck. Yield, he demanded, only to feel something tap against his thigh. Looking down, he found Naruto holding a blade directly over where the femoral artery could be found in his upper thigh. It's a tie, shouted the official, forcing himself between the two competitors before they decided to go for round two. Naruto found a hand held in front of his face, held there by his opponent. Taking the offered limb, Naruto was pulled to his feet, before maintaining the grip and began to shake Silet's hand causing the crowd to cheer even louder at the showing of honor. I know you don't plan on staying around since you're still on your journey, Naruto observed as he walked over to the judge's table with his opponent. But next time you come through, I expect your skills to be even better, and I want a rematch. Most definitely, Silet agreed as he was handed his half of the tournament's grand prize. You're my rival from now on, and I will defeat you soon enough. He waved over his shoulder before melting into the crowd, as if he never was there in the first place. Naruto endured the congratulations from the various fans as he made his way down the street back to his favorite pub. He felt that he had worked strong enough for the day, bringing in over 30 prospective new members to the Hawks, while making sure he had gotten all the kinks out after his battle with Zod. Naruto still wasn't sure why he had been healed during the battle, though he didn't remember much of what happened after being stabbed with Zod's sword. He had asked around for the events, but everyone had their own version of what happened, getting even more fantastical as the story was retold. The only two facts everyone seemed to agree on was that he had knocked Zod on his butt while giving him a new scar, and that said demon had promised to track him down to finish the beatdown he strong started on the blonde at a later date. F it, Naruto thought to himself as his ale was handed to him by the bartender. He wandered over to a booth in one of the darker corners, a curtain drawn around it for the privacy of its occupants. He had noticed that he was being followed inside the bar and wanted to give the person a chance to explain themselves before he reacted. Less than a minute after taking his seat, the curtain was slowly pushed aside by a dainty hand, allowing a two appealing serving wenches to enter the booth, sliding around the table to take a seat on either side of him. My lord, the brunette said, 
catching his attention as she held his arm between her considerable bust, we just wanted to. Thank you for what you did at that castle a week ago. At his confused look, she clarified further. That BSTRD in charge of the castle used to come here from time to time, and would allow his men to abuse us while he paid off the owner and guards to look the other way. We're AF Alehouse, not a BRTHL, and we choose who we want to sleep with. At her friend's firm nod, she continued, he voice becoming even more passionate. You save us from having to endure that ever again between killing the noble off, and setting up the hawk watch to make sure that it won't happen again. Her eyes had grown watery as she leaned forward, softly kissing his cheek to his shock. He became aware of a draft under the table, looking down to see little Naruto standing fully at attention as he was fully exposed. The other girl had been skillfully unbuttoning and removing his clothes from the waist down while his attention was pulled towards her co-worker. It's time that we showed you our appreciation my lord, said the brunette with a coy smile as she lowered herself between his legs under the table to join her friend. Naruto leaned his head back with his eyes shut in utter joy. He had a cold mug of ale in one hand, while he ran his other hand through a thick head of hair attached to a bobbing head in front of him. This was his idea of paradise, f all the pomp and frills that had to be endured from being noble. He could almost laugh at Griffith, knowing that the other young man had no idea what he was sacrificing as he single-mindedly worked towards his goal of ruling his own kingdom. Griffith sneezed as he lay propped up in his hospital bed. He had woken up an hour ago surrounded by nobles professing to be his allies and had spent the time promising favors to some while subtly threatening others to ensure that they remained on his side, even after the setback he had involving his injuries. He sneezed again, followed by a sudden urge to stab Naruto for some reason. He'd have to have the blonde tell him what he had been up to the next time he reported in. Naruto sighed to himself as he stared at the ceiling of the command tent. The night life of the hawk's garrison encampment echoed around him as men drank, gambled, chased whores, and fought each other. It had been two months since Griffith's injury and the men had begun to get bored with the hurry-up-and-wait approach of the mercenary lifestyle. Previously, they had been able to pick up and move on to the next job when they felt like it. Now though, the contract with Midland was for the rest of the war, and the hawks had just started to realize what freedoms they had given up. There were grumblings from a few corners of the camp, but the Hawks' lieutenants kept it suppressed in their own ways. Ironically both Casca and Guts believed that violence was the easiest way to solve the issue, leaving broken bodies in their wake at the first sign of mutiny. Corcus, Rickert, and Juddo leaned more towards coercion, threats, and bribery to bring the troublemakers back into the fold. Pippin was intimidating enough that the grumblings quieted as soon as his shadow fell over the men. Only Naruto would hear the men out, letting them air their grievances before promising to work on the situation. His previous solutions of the hawk watch and recruiting drives giving him enough credibility with the men to place their trust in him. The problem Naruto reflected to himself as he kicked his feet up on a barrel, letting him tilt the chair back to balance on its back legs, is that this is only a temporary calm. We need something to happen soon or it'll only get worse. Midland and Tudor were currently at something of a stalemate after the Hawks' latest military victory. The battle lines had to be shifted to reflect the newly captured lands and neither side seemed willing to be the first one to make the next aggressive move. Naruto considered his options as he pulled a knife out of its sheath on his belt, lightly dragging the tip of it across his palm and leaving a shallow cut across it. He watched in fascination as the skin around the wound slowly began to knit itself shut, steam rising as it did so. Within a few minutes, his hand looked as if nothing had happened to it at all, minus the escaped BLD left to dry on his skin. Ever since his battle with Zod, Naruto had seemed to heal faster and faster from wounds. He had discovered the change after taking a knife wound to the cab as he fought three recruits in the hawk's training yard. He had waved off all attempts at helping him, limping to the side of the arena and tagging in Pippin. He ignored the cries of despair coming from the ring, finding a place to sit against the wall. He tore off a portion of his sleeve, intending to stop the bleeding, but the wound was nearly closed already much to his surprise. One of the fighters slammed into the top of the wall above him, 
breaking his concentration. The fighter groaned in pain before sliding off the top and crashing down on top of the blonde. Sorry, Pippin rumbled deeply as he finished off the last man, his head turned towards Naruto in concern, ignoring the fighter entirely. The blonde slowly pulled himself out from under the pile of flesh and armor, noting that his new wounds were already closing up as well. Naruto blinked as his mind came back to the present, finishing its reminiscing. He glanced out of the tent, taking in the position of the moon. Not even an hour had gone by yet, signaling the beginning of a long and boring night. The Hawks' commanders had decided that they would split the command watch between them, each getting a day of the week to be in charge of the day-to-day -day operations. Casca surprised everyone by making the suggestion after the first month, much to the surprise of her fellow commanders. The fierce woman was not usually willing to give up a shred of her strong earned authority in the past. The others immediately jumped at the chance, thrilled to give the high-strung woman a chance to de-stress before she decided to grow even more violent. How Naruto regretted that decision now. He was on currently waiting for the night portion of the 24-hour shift to end, bored out of his mind at the lack of action. He had taken pity on the men helping with the watch, sending them off to enjoy the night's entertainment with the rest of their comrades. No one should have to suffer this level of boredom, he whined to himself as he cut his hand again, the pain being the only form of easy entertainment at the moment. Dispatches incoming was heard echoed through the camp, causing him to jerk his head up in interest. He ran to the front of the tent, pushing the flaps aside to meet the tired rider from the regular army as the man dismounted from his horse. Anything interesting, he asked the man, his eyes pleading for a positive answer. Look for yourself, the man grunted as he passed the LTHR satchel to the blonde. You're the last DLVRY for the night for me. He stared off forlornly at the beginning of the city in the distance, its dim lights barely showing through the darkness. I'm seriously not looking forward to the ride back, he mumbled as he prepared to mount his horse again. A hand fell on his shoulder, stopping his momentum and causing him to turn his head back towards the grinning blonde. Don't be in such a hurry to leave, the blonde said as he raised his hand, signaling to someone farther in the camp. You were kind enough to come all the way out here for us, now allow the favor to be returned. You can head back in the morning after the sun comes up. The man shook his head, reaching for the horse's reins again, I appreciate the offer, but I have to turn in the reports to the army headquarters in the morning. He turned towards his horse, only to stop this time at the sound of a feminine giggle from behind him. A soft hand pulled him around, letting him see that it was connected to an appealing brunette woman. She was wearing a tight-fitting dress, with the tie at the top loosened enough to show a generous hint of cleavage. The temptress began to walk backwards towards a large tent, beckoning him with a long graceful finger to follow. She pushed the tent flap aside, showing the dark silhouettes of more girls in various positions within. The man gulped, looking back at the city again, before handing his horse's reins to the blonde. Maybe I'll stay for a little bit, he mumbled as he walked towards the woman as if in a trance. Naruto gave the woman a thumbs up with a huge grin as she allowed the man to enter the tent, before closing it behind him. He tossed her a decent-sized bag of silver, the woman deftly catching it in the darkness without a hint of hesitation. She winked at the blonde before entering the tent, soft female laughing escaping before the tent closed again. Finally. Naruto said excitedly as he tied off the horse to the fence in front of the command tent. He pulled the LTHR case from the horse's side and walked back inside. Those can wait, he muttered throwing the dispatch folder on the table before taking his seat again and opening up the pouch containing the scouting reports. Boring, boring, bore. Oh, he lifted up a short note, obviously scrawled in a hurry on a dirty piece of paper. This is just what I need. He scrawled a quick note on the bottom of the page, before sweeping the rest of the notes back in the pouch and sealing it again. Time to get moving, he said cheerfully to himself his grin big enough to reflect the moonlight as he threw the pouch back on the horse, before walking hurriedly towards his tent. An hour later. A man pushed the tent flap aside, his eyes closing for a moment as they adjusted to the light from the lanterns after being outside in the dark. 
Commander Naruto. I felt bad about leaving you in here by yourself. I came to finish my. Oh no, not again. The flaps fluttered in the breeze as the man ran off into the night, faint shouting rising from the tents. A few minutes later, Casca stormed into the tent, armed with a sword and wearing only a night shirt. Her fellow commanders followed behind her in various states of undress, armed with whatever was close at hand. Only Guts was still fully armed and armored, having been working in the training yard when he was summoned. Where is that blonde idiot? I swear if he skipped off on his duty again. Casca's face was a storm cloud of anger as she scanned around the tent for her target. A clearing of a throat caused her to whirl around, showing Judo pointing to a note with a knife stabbed through it to hold it up against the central tent peg. Casca stormed over to it, reading out loud as the others crowded around her. A general and his retinue have been spotted touring Tudor's forwardmost base. Unable to get closer to identify who specifically. Supplies brought for an extended stay. Below the message was a hastily scrawled note, I call dibs. See you guys tomorrow. At the bottom was drawn a skull with spiky hair and a sword and hand axe crossed below it. I'll f kill him. Casca growled as she crushed the note in her hand. She was already making plans on who she needed to gather to bring their absent blonde back for punishment. Just let it go, Guts said as sat on a chair, pulling out his sword to start cleaning it with a rag. You know he's long gone by now. He'll be back tomorrow just like the note said, and you can have him then. He knew there was no way to catch Naruto with the head start the blonde already had. Casca gnashed her teeth as she listened to her formerly most hated man in the Hawks, Naruto clearly taking the lead with his latest stunt. Fine, she said, whirling towards the exit. I'm going to go find Griffith and let him know what that dumbass has done now. Guts shook his head as he watched her walk out, his eyes trailing down to her but as she moved. The shirt did nothing to hide her heavily defined leg muscles and he was a healthy young man. You guys can go back to sleep. I'll finish the watch, he said to the others as he settled in for what promised to be a busy night. Naruto cackled with glee as his horse raced through the darkness, the moon barely giving him enough light to navigate the path he was on. The enemy base he was nearing was the perfect location for what he had planned. With the reformed lines, this base was the last reach Tudor had into Midlands territory. The fort controlled the main road between the two kingdoms, and was surrounded on three sides by Midland's army, Tudor doing just enough to keep the supply lines open, unwilling to give up their strong one prize. Both sides hung well back from each other, to the point that the armies were out of line of sight with each other except for the occasional scout. The blonde slowed his horse to a trot as the well-lit palisade walls began to show through the trees. A space of 100 feet had been cleared between the walls and the surrounding forest to allow the archers a clear field of fire towards any encroaching enemy. Naruto tied the horse off to a tree branch, patting the animal's flanks as it lowered its head to graze. He snuck towards the tree line, waiting for a break in the patrolling sentries before sprinting over the open ground and pressing himself up against the wall, out of the line of sight of the men above. At the next break in coverage, he took out two daggers, beginning to scale the wall silently and swiftly like a spider on its web. He paused as he heard a loud voice from inside the compound, shaking his head at the man's antics before continuing his climb. General Adon roared in laughter again as the base's commander paid him another simpering compliment as he walked down the base's main road. These pathetic worms always sucked up to him whenever he felt the need to grace their command with an inspection. And they should be thankful that someone of his stature and pedigree was willing to make the time to travel out to such a SHT hole as this. Yes captain, he said, waving his hand to signal the man to move past the empty platitudes. I understand that you haven't been getting all of the supplies that you requested, but do understand the situation that you are in right now. At the man's questioning look, he roared in outrage. You're the last of our forward bases. You control the road directly towards those bastards' capital. It is your holy duty to protect it for when our armies are ready to attack again. He loomed over the cowering man, 
poking his armored finger into the man's BRST plate. You will defend this base to the last man. There is no retreat. Do you understand? He paused as a whistling sound was heard, before the base commander jerked, his eyes flying open in pain. The man gave a soft groan before pitching forward, a small throwing knife hilt sticking out of the back of his head. Attack! Adon shouted, hurling himself into cover behind a building, peeking out and scanning the area for any sign of the enemy. Follow me, he ordered his eight accompanying knights from his army, before kicking in the door to the supply building next to him. You four secure the other exits, the knights indicated rushed off towards the back of the building. You three guard the front entrance. This will be my command post for the future. And you, he indicated towards the last night, go find whoever is in charge now. We need to figure out how to find the attackers. The unlucky man saluted before running off into the night, returning minutes later with a sub-commander and two sergeants. The men stood rigid before the general, knowing that this was the moment that would either make or break their careers. Gentlemen, the dawn said as he paced in front of them, we have been infiltrated by at least one attacker, most likely several. You each will take a third of the men in the base, minus the ones on the walls and scour the grounds for these villains. I will remain here to guard the supplies against sabotage. Move out. He missed he eye rolls of the three as they headed for the entrance, shouting at the mob outside to gain some measure of control. Naruto grinned as he crouched on the roof of the supply building, listening to the entire conversation. It always amazed him how fast DSPLN broke down in a unit when something unexpected was thrown at them. Roughly a hundred men stood outside, shivering in the damp as they huddled together closer for warmth as they listened to the sub-commander's orders. They constantly eyed the shadows, jumping at the slightest sounds and coming close to stabbing each other. Phase 1, alarm is successful, he reflected to himself. Now it's time for phase 2, panic to commence. We should have just listened to Jacob, muttered one of the men as they patrolled down a dark alley between the huts. It's been an hour and no one has found anything. Odds are someone just threw that blade over the wall and got lucky. Those guys that went back to sleep had the right idea. You think we can get away with it, asked the fourth member of their squad, responsible for the rear guard duty. I'll go if you guys do. The lead looked back, getting nods of assent from the others. Screw it. Come on guys we've done our duty, time to go back to bed. The group made their way back to the tenth city, navigating through the dark to find their shelter. What the hell? the leader said, lifting his boot from the soggy ground. Did those bastards just go outside their tent again instead of heading to the latrine? That's just disgusting. I don't think that's PSS, one of them muttered, bringing flint to tinder and lighting a torch. The bottom of the tent fabric was stained a dark red, BLD pooling at the base of the entrance. What the F? whispered the leader, pushing the flap aside with his sword to reveal a vision of hell to the others. Ten cots were occupied at the moment, all of them dripping BLD to the floor as it drained from the neck stumps of the corpses. The heads were hung by wire, connected to the ceiling post. They slowly swung in circles, their empty eyes staring out at the still living. The men all jumped back, putting distance between themselves and the tent-turned slaughterhouse. The man with the torch slowly swung it in a circle, revealing three other tents similarly stained red in their vicinity. We have to find the sub-commander, the leader whispered, before he grabbed the torch and ran back towards the supply shack, leaving his subordinates behind. Hey, one of them shouted, sprinting after the light, only for it to disappear around the corner. The men turned after passing the final tent, only to come to a halt before a hole in the ground. The body of the missing leader could be seen at the bottom, at least three stakes stabbed through him. The men slowly moved around the pit before running the rest of the way back to the general's command. When they arrived, they were disheartened to see that only thirty others had made it from the group of one hundred an hour ago. Where the hell are your leaders, roared the general from inside the building. There was no way he was sticking his head outside until he knew it was safe. Dead with the others, he heard murmured from somewhere in the group, 
unable to identify the man in the dark. Okay. He muttered, thinking fast. From now on you stay in one large group. Start in one corner of the compound and work your way towards the other in a sweep. He looked up at the walls. We're going to need the rest of the men for this. Hey! Get down here now. All of the guards remained stationary, keeping their vigil on the wall. You, he pointed at a soldier in the front of the group, run up there and get their attention. The man scampered off to the stairs, everyone watching his progress. He approached the closest sentry, tapping the man on the shoulder only for the guard to fall backwards off of the wall into the compound, his throat slit from ear to ear. The man peered farther down the wall, before running back to the group, pushing his way into the middle of them. I don't think they'll be joining us general, he said once he felt safer. DMN it, Adon growled to himself before raising his voice again. Go carry out your orders now. Skirmish line. Sound off if you see something. The man vanished back into the darkness of the night, causing the general to shiver as he moved farther into the building away from the walls. He heard the voices of the men as they called out to each other while starting the search. He tracked the voices as they slowly made their way past the middle of the base and his command post before continuing on. The strange thing though was that it seemed like the amount of voices lessened as the search went on until he lost track of all of them. Now the base was covered in an oppressing blanket of silence. Even the insects dared not make a sound as they acknowledged the existence of an alpha predator in their midst. What's that smell? He heard one of his guards say before his nose caught the odor as well. That's the smell of flesh burning, he murmured, causing his men to all turn towards him. The enemy is lighting the compound on fire. We need to evacuate now. Form a circle on the road around me and move towards the stable by the gate. His men nodded together, happy to have clear orders for once. They moved outside, forming a tight circle as they gazed at their own personal version of hell surrounding themselves. Fire was everywhere, consuming everything it could touch. Horses screamed as the stable began to alight around them. Look sir, one of the knights shouted, pointing back towards the front of the supply depot they were just in. A crude drawing in BLD was made on the side of the wall. A chibi version of a spiky-haired man was holding what obviously was Adon's head, the body laying on the floor. Greetings from the Hawks was written below it, the letters still dripping down from the excess BLD used. It's the headhunter. Adon exclaimed, his voice slightly cracking in fear. I need to leave. Right now. He looked around wildly, sure that there was a sword SWNGNG for his neck that very instant. A piece of wire was jerked suddenly, hooking around the boot of one of his knights. The man screamed as his feet were yanked out from under him, causing him to faceplant into the dirt. He looked up, reaching to his general for help before he was pulled away from the group into the roaring inferno. His screams becoming more shrill for a moment before they ceased altogether. He's picking us off. Adon shouted, before shoving the knight in front of him roughly. Let's go. The knight moved out, followed closely by the others. They moved as one unit, keeping the circle tight as they marched. A wire was slowly lowered from the roof of a building, almost invisible to the naked eye as General Adon passed under it, before it dipped low enough to catch the last knight acting as rear guard. The wire tightened, lifting the man off the ground with a startled cry before tightening and cutting into his neck. No one heard it happen until Adon noticed a gap in the formation. He spied the man desperately trying to get his attention before deliberately turning around and speeding up again. You two get the gates, the rest of us will mount up. The two men saluted before running for the gates, struggling to move the heavy crossbar. Adon clambered up on his horse, the beast half crazy with fear as everything around it burned. Noticing the gate was opened, he spurred his horse forwards, quickly followed by the rest of his men. As he passed the gates, he noticed the two bodyguards were pinned to the doors by their own blades driven through their chests. He spurred his horse into a full gallop at the sight, uncaring about safety, just wanting to escape. 
A glint on the road caught his eye a second too late to react. The horses ran over the caltrops, pitching forwards and crashing as they cried out in pain. Adon was able to roll with the fall as was three of his men, the fourth falling badly and breaking his neck. The general pushed himself to his feet, looking back to see the compound turned into a raging inferno. A single tall figure was seen exiting the gates, his features unable to be seen as he was lit from behind by the fire. Enough of this running bullshit, Adon said, stepping in front of his men and readying his halbred. You don't have anywhere to hide out here coward. Face the 140-year-old technique passed down by my family. Rock-cutting whirlwind. His men watched, taking pride in their general's battle prowess as the man leapt towards the shadowy figure, Halberd coming down in a power strike of epic proportions. The figure watched the attack as it approached. Before taking a single step to the right, the halberd burying its head in the road next to him. The man calmly walked up to Adon's stunned face, before decking him with a punch to the face, breaking the general's nose and sending him to the dirt. Protect the general, shouted one of the guards, rushing forwards with his brothers to protect their liege. Adon could only watch from the dirt in terror as the first guard strike was parried before his arm was chopped off at the shoulder. The second guard was kicked in the middle, stunning him long enough for a hand axe to be buried in his forehead. The last guard approached slowly, engaging the shadow in a clash of blades that lasted for a few strikes before both of them backed away. The shadow looked over the knight's shoulder, seeing the Tudor army's men beginning to approach in the distance. A knife was flung at the knight's helmet, driving his face upwards and allowing the shadow's blade to meet his neck unimpeded. The fountain of BLD drenched Adon, coloring him in a ghastly red hue. The shadow closed on him, the figure leaning forward until he was inches from the general's face before flashing a huge grin, the teeth almost glowing as they reflected the moonlight. Boo! General Adon did not scream like a little girl as he scrambled backwards on all fours. He did not turn tail and run like a coward back towards the advancing army. What happened was that he leapt heroically to his feet before fighting a standing withdrawal back towards his army so he could inform them of what to expect. Naruto laughed to himself before his face twisted up in disgust. I think he just SHT himself, he mumbled as he turned back around towards the fort, intent on leaving the area. The front runners of the army watched as their general retreated back through their lines, not even stopping to acknowledge them. Do you smell SHT? One of them asked as he checked the bottom of his boot. DMN I'm awesome, the blonde congratulated himself as he rode back to camp, the sun rising behind him as he rode. Everyone was already up and moving about from what he could tell, though the movement looked a little too organized to be just regular morning routine. Naruto slowed down as he entered the camp, his mind racing for what the purpose of the activity was. There he is. Get him he heard screeched out from his left. He turned to greet the familiar voice, knowing immediately who it was. Hi Casca. Did you miss me? I left you a note. Her snarling visage was the last thing he saw before the world went dark around him. Naruto woke up in the middle of the fighting arena in the center of camp. He was hogtied on his back with his feet in the air and no weapons to speak of. His six fellow hawk commanders surrounded him in a loose circle, the rest of the hawks ringed the outside of the pit. Everyone wanting to see a piece of the show. The crowd silenced as they noticed Naruto moving around, waiting excitedly to see what would happen. From Naruto's upside-down perspective, a pair of white boots filled his view, traveling downwards into a set of white armor, that Griffith was apparently wearing. It's good to see you back in your gear. Are you ready to get out on the field again? Griffith snorted, a small smile on his face as he regarded his most troublesome hawk. Did it work as we planned? he asked. Naruto nodded his head as best he could. We should know any time now. I think I might have done too good a job in all honesty. Noticing his leader's skeptical look, he decided to elaborate. Trust me, you'll love the story. I'll take you to this bar I know and we'll discuss it over a few pints. What the hell is he talking about? Casca demanded, stomping up to the young men, 
the vein on her forehead showing for all to see from her stress level. Aren't you going to punish him, she asked her leader. He disobeyed a direct order, she said while kicking the blonde in the ribs. He abandoned his post, she continued on, kicking Naruto again. And he left an asinine letter saying he called dibs, with that she kicked Naruto a third time, this time strong enough to roll him over on his side as he wheezed for breath. Taking a moment to catch her breath, she realized that all of her pent-up stress had disappeared. I'm going to need to beat him more often, she thought to herself, sending a shiver down Naruto's spine as he watched her changing expressions. This armistice can't continue, or we'll go broke and starve, Griffith said, causing multiple gasps to pop up as the hawks considered their position. Our livelihoods depend on going out to fight in battles. We don't get paid like the regular army does, and the contract states that we can't work for anyone else. They have the power to starve us out if they want to until we disband. Naruto has been working overtime to keep the income coming from other directions such as city watch and tournaments, but we both agreed that this ceasefire had to end sooner than later. That's right, Naruto said as he wormed his way onto his back again to see everyone. I kept my eyes peeled, and when I saw the opportunity appear last night, I took it immediately. But what did you do? Judo asked, starting to understand the two men's thought process. Naruto opened his mouth to answer, but was interrupted by war horns in the distance, signaling that a massive attack was imminent. I went out and picked a fight with Tudor, he said smugly, causing everyone's heads to WHP back in his direction. I burned down their forward base, murdered their garrison, and made their commanding general SHT himself before I sent him running back to his army. If that didn't PSS them off enough to attack, then I don't know what would have. Corcus started to clap slowly, pausing to wipe a tear away from his eye. That was truly appealing work Naruto, he praised. Judo, Rickert, and Pippin soon joined in, admiration clearly shown in their eyes. Guts rolled his eyes before walking forward. Unsheathing his blade, he cut Naruto's bindings allowing the blonde to climb to his feet. As long as you set up a good fight, I don't care what you have to do. Naruto leapt to his feet, rubbing his wrists to bring feeling back to them. So, he said addressing his leader, are we joining the vanguard, or picking up the glory at the end of the battle again? I'm feeling good today, Griffith replied, raising his voice as he pulled his blade, raising it to the sky as he addressed his men. What do you say? Are you ready to go earn some money? An earth-shaking cheer was his answer as all of the men turned and ran for their tents, intent on suiting up for war as quickly as possible. There's your answer, he said to Naruto before turning and heading to the stables. Let's mount up, he ordered. Naruto waited for Kaska to walk by before slapping her on the butt strong enough to make her cheeks jiggle. That's payback for those cheap shots, he called over his shoulder as he ran off, the livid woman hot on his heels and ready to dish out pain. Guts let his brother catch up to him before tripping him and sending the blonde tumbling. He held Naruto down with a boot to the back, ignoring his brother's look of betrayal as Kaska approached. The warrior woman pushed her sleeves back in preparation before a arm shot out in front of her, blocking her advance. She looked up at Guts in confusion before she saw that he was holding out a steel helmet that he had picked up off the ground. Use this if you want him to feel it, the man said as he turned to walk away. Casca smiled softly at the large man's back, surprised and touched that Guts was so willing to help her in her righteous quest for bringing the pain to Naruto. He's not such a bad guy after all, she reflected to herself before stomping on Naruto's back as he tried to sneak away. I hope that slap was worth it, she growled, because you're going to be paying for it for a long time to come. Where am I? Casca thought as she panicked, looking around wildly, rolling hills of grass the only thing in sight. The sun was setting, painting the sky in a red haze that reflected the violence and bloodshed occurring almost constantly beneath it. The perspective felt all wrong causing her to look down, only to realize that she was back in the body of her preteen self. Heavy, labored breathing caused her to turn her head with trepidation, only to see her worst nightmare come to life. A fat, elderly noble leered at her from where he was doubled over, hands on his knees, 
as he tried to catch his breath. Thank you for seeing reason in stopping little one, he wheezed before his arm flew out lightning quick to catch her shoulder. He slowly pushed her to the ground, laying himself on top of her. I believe we'll consummate our new relationship now before any more interruptions can occur. He leaned in to lick her neck, his rancid breath causing her stomach to almost lose its contents. A large hand gripped the front of her dress, tearing it down to her navel and exposing her to all the world around her. She could feel a little of herself die as her mind began to retreat into itself, aware that fighting back would be pointless. The man leaned back onto his knees, bringing his hands down to remove the belt over his doublet when a liquid splattered across her face. Casca furiously rubbed her eyes clean, aware that the weight had shifted off of her but unable to tell why. Finally clearing her eyes, she noticed that her hands looked as if they were dyed red. A large trail of red spread across her chest, trailing down her legs. She followed it to the headless body of the noble who lay sprawled at her feet. The girl slowly looked up, feeling strangely satisfied as she viewed the noble's head being held by his hair, his expression locked forever in a look of utter shock and pain. The hand released the head, allowing it to roll away down the hill, before reaching out to her. She gripped as if her life depended on it, letting it pull her to her feet. She found herself looking up at Naruto who was grinning down at her with that full smile of his. Her vision blurred again as she noticed Naruto didn't appear quite so tall now. She looked down, seeing the remnants of her dress at the feet of her now adult-sized body, yet feeling no shame at her NDTY in front of her fellow commander. It's time you got back in the battle, the blonde commented as he tied her commander's cape around her shoulders. He turned and sprinted away to where she could see Guts in the distance, fighting the noble's bodyguards single-handedly. She noticed her sword was laying at her feet. Picking it up, she realized her body felt lighter than it had for a long time now. Letting out a shout, she charged towards the battle and the two brothers that had saved her. Casca opened her eyes, noting that the sun was much higher in the sky, barely reaching noon. As her senses began to come back into focus, the sounds of battle being waged around her began to register. She pushed herself off of the ground, only to come up short as a large weight across her legs became known as it stopped her upward movement. In a flash, her memories came pouring back to her. She had still been pissed off at Naruto for his antics the night before. To make matters worse, Griffith had sent her to lead the cavalry charge instead of letting her be by his side like normal, and leaving her wondering what she had done wrong. The straw that broke the camel's back was seeing Naruto nudge his brother, leaning in to whisper to him before looking back at her and laughing his butt off. Guts glanced in her direction, before quickly looking away with a slight blush, a scowl marrying his face. Before she even had a chance to address the brothers, the horn sounding the beginning of the attack was sounded. Casca spurred her horse, giving out a war cry that eclipsed the largest men in her company as she charged forward, only to realize that she didn't stay in formation with her company, outpacing the rest of them by a significant margin. Too late to stop, she met the enemy with a clash. They quickly moved to envelope her before the rest of the hawks could arrive, only to back up in a hurry as she killed four of the with precise thrusts and slices. Her skill was the only thing keeping her alive as they pressed their attack. She lasted for a few frantic minutes before one of the footmen was lucky enough to stab her horse with his pike, losing his life in the process. She heard her name shouted out by multiple people as her horse pitched over, the ground rushing up to meet her before everything went dark. HR recollection was interrupted by a large shape looming over her. The glint of steel was her only warning as she threw up her sword, barely parrying the axe blow that would have taken her head off. She brought her sword up quickly, slicing into the man's thigh with surgical precision as a river of red poured out of the fatal wound. Her attacker was quickly replaced with two more, their blades raised in tandem to avoid a possible parry. Her life flashed before her eyes only for her to crash back to reality as a hand axe seemed to grow out of one of the men's head while the other disappeared entirely, a large black mass taking his place as he flew backwards like a ragdoll. Is she alive? She heard the dark mass roar out, guts her mind identified, 
as he began to frantically beat back the opposing knights. A second head appeared in her vision, gaining her attention as fingers snapped in front of her face. She scowled, batting the hand away in annoyance as she lifted her sword to defend herself again. She's just fine, Naruto said with a grin, not even looking back as he parried an attack behind himself before killing the attacker with his return slide. Oi Kaska, he called out, sounding like he just ran into her in the street instead of being in the middle of a pitched battle. Are you just going to lay around all day, or are you done having us fight your battles? She rolled her eyes at the flippant question, before gesturing to the horse on top of her lower body. I'd love to but I'm a little tied up at the moment. Rest assured I'll be evening the score later today. Naruto opened his mouth to reply but was interrupted by his brother's exasperated cry. Will you shut the F up and help her out already? He looked over his shoulder as he parried a mace strike, rage being the only emotion present as his body began to go on autopilot. You're not the one holding off an entire army here. He wasn't sure if the fight was what really got him enraged, or if it was his brother getting a little too close to the hawk's female commander. It wasn't worth thinking about at the moment. Fine, fine ruin my fun you kill Joy, the blonde muttered as he stooped over and grabbed the saddle. Casca's mouth dropped open as she watched every muscle on the blonde practically bulge under his skin before he slowly pulled the horse carcass off of her, allowing her to scramble to her feet. She had thought Guts and Pippin the only ones capable of such a feat of strength before now, the list of strong men in the hawks growing by one in her head. The enemy army began pulling back, massing itself for another cavalry charge, not wanting to miss killing three of the most famous hawk commanders at once. She looked around in confusion, unable to see any other hawks behind her. Only a few bodies of those unlucky enough to take an arrow to a vulnerable spot lay on the field. Where the hell is everybody, she cried out. This was nothing like the battle plan she had discussed before the engagement. Naruto grabbed two riderless horses, handing her the reins of one as he hopped on the back on the other. He wheeled in a quick circle, frowning as he noticed that the enemy was almost upon them before he was gone in a flash, riding in the opposite direction over a hill as fast as his horse could take him. Casca couldn't believe the cowardice she was seeing, unable to connect the action with the normally dependable blonde that she knew over the years. Where is he going? she asked softly. She wasn't expecting the answer, jumping as Guts placed his horse in front of her. What are you doing? he roared out. Get the F on your DMN horse. He continued on calmer as she mounted up behind him. Don't worry about Naruto. He's doing what he does best right now, and the rest of the hawks are following his and Griffith's new plan. The old one fell apart with your charge. He trailed off with a growl, making her blush as she averted her gaze in embarrassment. He pulled up his sword, holding it parallel to his body, the blade facing the charging horde. Watch my back. We're stopping this group all by ourselves. He charged forward without waiting for a reply, confident that she would do as he requested. The first man he met was sliced in half at the waist, his horse's head joining him in a lazy arc across the sky as they both wondered what went wrong. The charge stuttered for a second at the show of brutality before Guts found their ranks, the wedge of men and horses splitting around him on both sides like a river around a large rock. Body parts and BLD flew as he ground through the opposing knights, no one able to slow him, let alone score a hit. Casca followed in his wake, forcing down her feelings of awe to allow her to kill anyone with the bright idea to circle behind him for a cheap shot. Guts forced his way through over half of their ranks before a horn blew two sharp blasts, causing the charge to halt entirely. The enemy wheeled as one body, before charging headlong back up the hill behind them as all thought of DSPLN broke down at the signal for retreat. Casca watched in wonder as the enemy made it halfway up the hill before a great war cry echoed all around them. Movement at the top of the hill caught her attention. Griffith trotted forward, clad in his white armor and looking like an avenging angel as he looked down on the sinners before him. He raised his sword over his head, before bringing it down in a slash at the opposing army. Following his wordless signal, 
the hawks poured over the hill, enveloping the enemy who had already had their fighting spirit broken and now faced a hopeless situation. It took less than half an hour of fighting for the battle to finish itself, the hawks driving the mass of enemies back into themselves as they ground them into the dust. The hawks' female commander watched this from the valley where it all started. She sat next to Guts, listening as the man critiqued the battle under his breath. She grinned lightly as she heard him huff about, should have just killed the horse and spilled the stupid effer. Sometimes it was nice just dealing with someone as straightforwards as the large man. Griffith joined them, observing the cleanup as the men searched the bodies for valuables, and rendering assistance to fallen hawks. That went better than even I expected, he said, waving at someone in the distance. Let's go, he said, indicating for the two to accompany him as he headed to the hill to the back and left of Thiers. As they neared the summit of the hill, they spied the black smoke of a recent fire curling into the sky. A small battle had taken place at the summit, over a dozen bodies lay in various states of dismemberment. Judging by their expensive-looking armor and elaborate plumage on their helmets, Guts guessed that it must have been the army's command staff. Naruto sat on top of a trunk in front of them, the command tent burning merrily behind him like a signal fire for his victory. He waved distractedly to his friends as they rode up, his head buried in a dispatch as he slowly sifted through a pile of loot in front of him. Sorry I didn't do it exactly to plan but you wouldn't believe what I found. He threw a horn up to Griffith who looked at it for a moment before snorting in laughter. He quickly passed it to Guts who had a similar reaction as well. Casca couldn't contain her curiosity anymore, snatching the horn out of Guts' hands and turning it over to find a crude carving on its side. Her eyes widened in disbelief as she read it, before looking back up at the giggling blonde. I know right? Naruto exclaimed, the humor in his voice impossible to miss. The dumb BSTRD couldn't even remember the signals, so he carved them into the side of the horn. My fire was supposed to cause the army to break ranks and come back to see what happened, but when I found that little gem, how could I refuse the chance to F with them? I won't hold it against you, Griffith assured him. What did you find in the tent? he asked, gesturing to the blaze. Naruto shrugged, passing the letter up to his boss. That's just his current set of orders, which we pretty much invalidated. He grinned, slowly pulling a longer sheet out of the pile in front of him. This though, is a list of the current spies and traitors that Tudor has planted in Midland's military. I'm willing to bet I can get a pretty good reward for it. Is there anyone you want to take care of yourself before I pass it up? He asked, turning it to show his fellow hawks. Griffith and Casca shook their heads, unsure if they should take the blonde up on his macabre offer. Guts grew excited though as he looked closer at a few of the names. Those bastards owe me money from a poker game a while back. They ran when a fight broke out before I could collect. They've been hiding behind some prissy noble's protection since then. I'll give you 24 hours to collect before I ruin what's left of them, Naruto assured him, getting a fist bump in thanks from his brother. Let me pack all of this up and I'll join you guys at the base camp. He turned back around towards his loot, and the bodies he needed to strip. This might take a while, he thought to himself as he tried to figure out where to start. You knew. UF knew this would happen and you didn't warn me. Griffith rolled his eyes at the blonde's antics as they walked towards the castle's main entrance. What did you think would occur when you not only revealed the list to the generals, but offered to capture the traitors yourself? Trust me, the last thing they wanted was to make the headhunter into a knight, but you didn't leave them much choice. This was too big of a deal to sweep under the rug from the king and his brother. Of course they'd reward you. The white-haired man paused, considering the situation. You're too much of a threat now. Making you a knight of the realm tied you to Midland and ensured that you wouldn't be hunting them on a battlefield sometime in the future. So pretty much the exact way they clipped your wings too. Ha! Huh. He received an elbow to his ribs for the comment, though Griffith looked a bit depressed as well having realized the same thing. Hey, he said, determined to cheer up his friend. This puts you one huge step closer to being a king of your own right. Seeing Griffith's questioning look, 
he elaborated, nobility means title, title means land, land becomes a kingdom, and you already have your own army which you'll need to defend said kingdom. You've put a lot of thought into this for someone who professes to not want to either lead or be a noble themselves, Griffith said to his blonde friend. Are you sure you don't have an ambition similar to mine? Just because I don't want or appreciate the finer things in life doesn't mean I don't know how the game is played, Naruto informed his friend. I just don't need a creepy but piece of jewelry to know what I'm truly capable of. He shuddered as he looked at the red behelot that Griffith absentmindedly played with in his hand. The only thing that has been good for was getting Zod to stop from killing your butt. And that was a near thing from what I hear from Guts. At least he's done with me one way or the other, Griffith countered, stung that Naruto would talk so bad about his precious. From what I hear, he promised that you and he would have a rematch to figure out who the Alpha will be. He watched Naruto wince, the blonde glancing towards the night sky as if waiting for the immortal beast to drop on his head from on high. I'll always have your back Naruto, but I have no idea how we're going to stop him when he turns back up. What the hell did you do to him anyways? Naruto shrugged, I have no idea, I don't remember a DMN thing after he pinned me to the wall and started beating on you and guts. I guess I gave him a new scar but hell if I know how. He shuddered as he glanced up at the castle that they now stood just outside of. The light from the party within streamed out through the many windows and doors, the nobility's voices carrying outside to their ears. I'd still rather face him in battle any day than have to deal with what we're about to. Be careful what you wish for, Griffith murmured as he straightened his shirt and flourished his tie, making sure he looked the part of the dashing young knight. This was his night to shine and his blonde friend wanted to be miserable then that was his problem. All I ask is that you don't embarrass myself and the hawks. Tonight I take the next step to my dream, he murmured as the servants opened the doors for him. Sir Griffith. Of the band of the hawk. Princess Charlotte looked up excitedly from her spot on the royal platform, thrilled to catch a glimpse of the mysterious knight that was all the talk of the ladies of the court. Her mother harumphed, hiding her frown behind her fan as she examined the new BLD in the court as he made his way down the stairs. Her father the king smiled good-naturedly, unwilling to break character in front of his court as the benevolent and wise ruler of his kingdom. There was power in an image after all. The princess watched as Sir Griffith make his way down to the floor of the ballroom. The poor man was immediately mobbed by the single women of the court, along with various well-wishers hoping to curry his favor. He handled the situation with the grace she expected him to have, giving each person a moment of his time and acknowledging them before moving on to the next. She smiled as she saw his knightly behavior shine better than all of those around him. Sir Naruto. Also of the band of the hawk. The princess looked up, surprised to hear a second name announced from Sir Griffith's forces. The man had the sunniest blonde hair she had ever seen before. It stood out like a beacon in the ballroom, reflecting the light as he grinned while slowly walking down the stairs. I've never heard of this man before, the queen murmured, unsure of what to make of him. He would need to be examined to figure out if he would be a threat or a new tool in her court. I knighted him earlier today, said the king as he looked on over his subjects. He did the kingdom a great service and is a monster on the field of battle. You've probably heard his nickname the Headhunter whispered around the court before now. I felt it best to bring him into the fold sooner rather than later. I see, the queen whispered excitedly, her eyes burrowing a hole into the blonde as he took up a position in the corner of the ballroom, unlike his commander who seemed to be holding court in the center of the floor. She would most definitely need to investigate what made the blonde tick soon. He was too valuable to leave alone for long. How can he be the headhunter? Charlotte asked, confused by what she saw so far. He doesn't look anything like all the scary stories I've heard about the man who hunts nobles for sport. He just seems like a young, happy, handsome knight. Let this be a lesson for you my dear, the queen said as her husband nodded in agreement. The most dangerous people you will ever find aren't those that are obvious about their feelings. Someone who looks like a thief or a murderer is much less of a threat. They're easily managed and dealt with. 
Someone who can look and act normal though, but still has a killer instinct is a very dangerous individual indeed. Many in our military who are nobles have the same ability, though none who are so well adjusted as he is. Such a kind smile and eyes, yet able to perform such acts of violence. She trailed off, admiration clear in her voice. Charlotte shivered as she watched her mother's expression change. She hated it when her mother became involved in court intrigue. The princess made a vow to get to know more about Sir Naruto, one way or the other. For now though, Sir Griffith was within eyesight, and that was more than enough for her. Naruto breathed a sigh of relief as the last well-wisher moved off to find someone else to talk to, leaving him alone for the first time since his arrival to the ball. He had never heard so much said with so little actual content before, but these people seemed to make a sport of it. It didn't help that all of the ladies seemed to be fawning over him like he was a piece of meat, asking him about his battle prowess and the victories he had amassed. The men he could understand at least. The whole point of their conversations was to figure out where he fit in the social structure and to make sure he knew where they did as well. He did find it intriguing though that a few different generals made mention of using a man of his talents in their own armies though. He listened to their offers, making sure to say he would be in touch later and never outright denying them. He did not have the political clout to do so, and it would reflect badly on the hawks if he tried. Griffith had kept an eye on him through the night, but didn't intervene, whether due to having confidence in the blonde's abilities, or being unable to break away from his ever-growing crowd, Naruto wasn't sure. What the blonde knight did know though was that he had the uncomfortable luck of having the royal's attention for most of the night. The king and the princess he could figure out easily enough, both just wanted to get the measure of him in a different environment than the battlefield. He hoped he had made a good enough impression. The queen though, she made him nervous. He had no intention of staying around in court any longer than he needed to, his place was fighting others in war. It was time to make himself scarce. Out of sight, out of mind. Naruto breathed a sigh of relief as he reclined back against the side of the castle while the party's noise washed over him. He had slipped out through one of the open windows onto the balcony, before following it as it wrapped around the outside of the building. No one was out here, allowing him some solitude from the guests. He let the breeze wash over him as he closed his eyes, only for them to fly back open as he picked up a new scent. In the seconds that he had shut his eyes, a woman in a form-fitting light blue ball gown had effortless and silently glided up next to him. Now she stood by his side, staring off over the palace grounds herself. She looked to be in her mid-twenties and had shoulder-length black hair that fell around her face like a curtain, framing aristocratic facial features, full of sharp angles yet soft lips and kind eyes. She came up to his shoulder in height with a lithe yet filled out body. That only comes with strong work, not growing up soft, he reflected as he examined her from the corner of his eye. Not one for parties, she asked, her voice low enough to keep anyone but her intended target from hearing her. He reflected that if sounded much softer than Casca's, not having spent years barking orders over the din of battle. He watched her finish up with her own inspection of him, noticing that she took particular delight in the whisker marks on his cheeks and his hands. She offered her hand to him as he turned and bowed, allowing him to place an embrace on the back of it with a small smile growing as he brushed a thumb over her hand before releasing it. About as much as you are my lady. My preferred location is a simpler setting, a nice tavern with my fellow warriors or by myself outdoors so I can observe nature at its fullest. Neither of them require me to keep up a false pretense to make others around me feel at ease. The woman glanced at him, bringing her hand up to push a bang back behind her ear. I'm sure I have no idea what you are talking about good sir. Ladies of the court thrive in such an environment as this. Naruto cast her a flat look, turning to face her as he leaned on the rail. The calluses on your hand say otherwise. He snatched her hand up before she could react rubbing his thumb over her palm and fingers one by one. If I had to guess, I'd say you can use a bow with your right hand dm and He paused, feeling a particularly built-up area on her palm. Well, 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 
someone is good with a sword too. I still can't figure out what would cause this last set though. Care to fill me in my lady, he asked, arching an eyebrow. Is this how you come on to all of your conquests good sir, was the coy reply. A quick tug of her wrist made him realize that he was still holding her hand. He smiled grandly as he let it go, leaning in towards her slightly as he looked into her eyes as they reflected the light from the torches. A flash of light was his only warning before a dagger was inches from his eye. I'm also good with these as well, said the black-haired beauty, her coy expression not changing at all as she threatened her companion. Naruto just smiled, shifting to the left before leaning into the blade enough for it to leave a shallow cut on his cheek above his topmost whisker. You can stop with all of this, sir, talk around me. I'm just Naruto to my friends. Her eyes widened in shock as the cut began to close up. Oh you just keep getting more and more interesting don't you? She ran her thumb over the former wound, the remaining BLD coming off onto her digit as she drew her hand back. She brought her thumb up to her lips, lightly sucking on it as if the BLD was a treat. Oh, that's positively delightful, she said in a throaty mmm, -mm, her voice almost purring. And you can call me Jessica. There is usually a lady in front of it, but I think we're well past that by now, don't you? Naruto gulped, nodding as he tried to shift enough to adjust himself without being obvious about it. Her smug grin showing that he had been less than successful in the endeavor. That was by far one of the most equally freaky, yet sexy things he had seen in his lifetime. Now it was time for a tactical retreat while he was still able to do so with the modicum of dignity he still possessed. I think it's about time that I took my leave from this gala. I hope you find the rest of the night enjoyable my lady. His companion frowned, irritated that the first interesting person she had found at one of these events was already leaving her. And you have a more pressing matter that you need to attend to instead of joining me for the rest of the night? These parties are dreadfully dull at the best of times. Alas I must attend to my duties. Maybe we'll meet again one day. Naruto bowed to her, capturing her hand for one final embrace before drawing back up to his full height. A quick scan verified that no guards were present on the balcony or the grounds below. He hopped over the rail, bending his knees to cushion the two-story landing before sprinting off across the grounds, his overcoat already removed in his rush to return to normalcy. Jessica scowled as she watched her prey make his escape. She had been so close to possibly finding an end from the purgatory that she had found herself in over the last few years. She felt something brush against her shin, causing her to reach down and pick it up. Naruto's tie fluttered in his hands, the wind having carried it back to her after he shed it during his hasty retreat. Maybe the night isn't a failure after all. The beauty reflected to herself. The lady brought the tie up to her nose, inhaling deeply the wonderful scent from it. If one looked closer, they would see her pupils slit as her pulse began to quicken. That was by far the most stressful night of my life, Naruto said with a sigh of relief as he pushed open the door to his favorite tavern. The blonde had already dressed himself back into his favorite LTHR armor, his weapons back at his side. The familiar weight of his gear reassuring him that all was right in the world again. He never appreciated that bit of normality until it wasn't available for him. Just one more thing he would have to sacrifice for his new rank. He greeted his comrades as he pushed his way to the bar. It was packed as the hawks came out in force to celebrate the good news for one of their own. Word had traveled fast about Naruto's promotion into the knighthood and everyone wanted to express their joy for him. A large mug of his favorite beer was moved into each of his hands as he made his through the crowd, enduring the multiple shouts and back slaps without spilling his drinks. The best thing about leading the Hawk Watch is definitely the perks he reflected to himself as he noticed that his corner booth was still open. He slid back into his seat with a sigh of relief, the curtains closing behind him and offering a moment of respite from the rest of the world. He took a small bag of silver, placing it on the bench near the exit as was tradition. The money would be picked up by the serving wenches and ensue that he had alcohol flowing to him for the rest of the night without having to leave his special spot. 
A rustle of curtains caught his eye as one of his favorite servers looked in on him with a soft smile. What will you have tonight dear, she asked with her curly brunette locks framing her kind smile and generous cleavage on display. I think I'm just in the mood for the usual, he said with a soft grin, the house pork loins already pictured in his head as his stomach growled softly. He missed the woman make a signal behind the curtain as he was lost in thought. His mind returned to the present as he watched her bend over to retrieve the silver, intentionally giving him enough of a show to excite him in the process. We'll have that right up for you Naruto, and we'll send you something special to tide you over in the meantime. Congratulations on the promotion, she said, before withdrawing from the booth as the curtains shut behind her. God I love this place, he muttered out loud, taking a swig of his beer as he leaned back. He was only surprised for a moment when a familiar head of blonde hair popped up under the table, deft hands already undoing the string tying his pants up. Let me guess, you're here to tide me over, he observed as he looked into her mischievous blue eyes. The girl simply smiled at him as she released his package from its confines before giving it a long lick from the base to the tip. Her eyes twinkled as she watched him shudder from her ministrations before engulfing him in her mouth and sinking down until her nose was buried in his big HR Naruto relaxed as he let the girl continue her work, sipping at his beer as he felt the day's stress slip away from him. He chuckled to himself as he imagined Griffith still in the center of the crowd in the ballroom, unable to escape. So this is the important duty you had to attend to. His neck bones cracked, such was the speed that his head whipped around to stare at the woman sitting across from him on the other side of the table. Jessica's grin couldn't have been any more smug as she watched him pale from her greeting. I hope you don't mind that I decided to join you. I just didn't feel that we ended the conversation the right way earlier and I assumed you'd be more comfortable in your normal environment. She pulled the extra mug of beer over to herself, drinking over half of the contents in one pull as she waited for the blonde to gather his thoughts. What the double F? Naruto's brain shouted in his head as he sat ramrod straight while observing the dangerous woman across from him. She had discarded her dress in favor of a red silk shirt with a black corset pulled tightly around it, while her legs were shown off perfectly in her tight LTHR pants and boots. She had at least four daggers visible on different parts of her body, as well as a good-sized LTHR pouch attached to her belt on one side, and a sword on the other. The woman in front of him now screamed danger and sexiness all rolled into one. It didn't help matters as for what was occurring out of sight below the table. The girl between his knees had initially stopped her work, freezing as another voice was heard in the booth. That had only lasted a moment though before she went right back to it, utterly silent as she worked to earn her treat for her efforts. I felt that I needed to be with the men more than some ball with people that all looked down their noses at me. He felt the need to defend his actions even though he didn't think he owed this woman anything. What is it exactly that we still needed to discuss anyways? He began to sweat as he body couldn't help but react to what he was receiving below the table. My dear boy, what we need to discuss is us, the temptress said with a giggle as she leaned forward. You've intrigued me more than anyone else has in years. Ever since my husband died long ago, I've had to endure countless attempts to woo me. Yet none of those pathetic excuses for males can even hold a torch to you, and I can tell that from one conversation. There is no way I'm letting you get away that easily, she cooed as she pulled a dagger from her shoulder strap spinning it effortlessly in her fingers while keeping her full attention on him. Besides, she said, licking her lips as she examined his face and body again in the better lighting, I haven't had been on a good ride for nearly a decade now and my dry spell stops tonight. She ignored him as he stiffened, choosing instead to knock on the table between them. You heard that right dear. I'll need him tonight so please don't go past the first round. Two knocks answered her back causing her to smile contentedly as she casually raised her leg to place it across his seat in front of the curtain, conveniently blocking his escape route. Let's make this a night to remember. Naruto whimpered at the look in her eyes. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 3. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author Mojo the Space Monkey on fanfiction.net. 
press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.